Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's installment of Cinema Strategies, brought to you by Kent State Independent Films. Like always, I, Samuel Tessier, have the privilege to be joined by the best and brightest minds in the film industry, and this week is no exception. Before we kick this off, uh, be sure to send your questions and comments in the chat so they can become a part of the conversation. Our guest today has acquired many titles throughout his tenure as a storyteller, including, and not limited to, the Duke of Dope Discourse, the Viceroy of Verisimilitude, and the Pharaoh of Physical Media. Here to discuss with us today about adapting IPs and history uh, in a faithful way is Robert Meyer Burnett. Thank you for coming and joining us. Well, it's it's a great honor. I, I feel like I've been, uh, I, I mean, Kent State giving it, it, it is, is it an independent film program club? Uh, how does that work? But it's an honor to be here. <laughs> yeah, Kent State Independent Films. Uh, on my uh, my screen is lagging behind, so uh, hopefully it's not going too bad for everyone. But if it is, I'll have to restart mine. But I'll be happy to. Uh, explain I should that do something once. funny with my voice. Wow. <laughs> you know, okay. If I could throw my voice or be a ventriloquist, I would to, to keep up with you. I have lost you. I feel that uh, perhaps if there's anybody that has any questions before Samuel comes back, <laughs> I can answer them. <clears throat> um, yeah. Okay. Uh, we could start over. We could start it over again. Um. I was just telling Samuel I'm very excited about the second site, Dawn of the Dead release that's coming out next week. I've been waiting for a proper Dawn of the Dead release on home video, physical media. Well, since I first got Dawn of the Dead back in uh, 1983, was it 83 on Thorn EMI Home Entertainment, home video? Um, I think that was it. But um, yeah. Okay, in my back. Right. You're back. You are back. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, my setup is a bit amateur, and uh, we have a lot of watchers, and I hopefully can keep up for the rest of the time. Uh, well, don't worry, because what we can do, you can always snip that off at the beginning when it's archived to YouTube. So yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, like you were, like you asked, uh, this is a independent film group. We're part of Kent State Student Media. Nice. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, we work with the, the digital media production uh, majors at Kent State, and we fund uh, like three short films each semester. That's what we wow. try to do. But yeah, yeah, it's difficult, especially this semester, because uh, there's a lot of restrictions on campus. Yeah. Uh, deservedly. So yeah, that's why we're trying to do a lot more stuff online and getting awesome guests like you, Robert. But well, I'm happy to be here. Happy to support, <laughs> happy to support budding filmmakers and digital artists and, you know, I had a lot of people that certainly were very um, influential in my life when I was a student and people that were supportive and gave me opportunities. So I'm happy to, whenever somebody wants to do that, when you contact me, I'm like, count me in. Yeah, it's awesome to see your enthusiasm. We're glad. So uh, <laughs> just uh, for the people who are the uninitiated out there, uh, who are you, Robert Meyer Burnett? Uh, <laughs> I explained your titles, but how did you earn those titles? Uh uh, the Viceroy of Verisimilitude, uh, <laughs> for example. Well, to describe that to the. I, I think I think that you know I think the first time I ever really considered the word verisimilitude was when I heard Richard Donner mention it in the documentaries on the making of Superman the movie, and the idea of verisimilitude is is basically it means to make something feel, look and uh, just appear real, authentic, like uh, of the real world. And I think that the greatest uh, trick or the greatest 
achievement in cinema, and I'm speaking verisimilitude, the Viceroy of verisimilitude, I'm speaking strictly uh, in terms of movies. Yeah. And, and I think that one of the great tricks that a movie can do is make you believe. You, you want to utterly believe that what you're watching is actually happening, when really all movies are entirely made up. You know, they're all, they're completely artificial. There's nothing about, unless you're watching, say, a documentary. But I mean, narrative feature films are completely made up. And I think the greatest, the greatest thing about movie magic is it makes you believe that what you're watching is, is utterly real. And that's that verisimilitude. If, if what's on the screen convinces you of its reality, then uh, it's done its job. And I think it's very hard to do that. It's very hard when you're making a film to make an audience believe because there's there's 10,000 different decisions that go into every moment on screen. And any one of those decisions, if it's wrong, will shatter that reality. And it could be anything from if your movie is set in, I don't know, 1940s, the 1940s, and someone's wearing uh, something that wasn't designed until the 1960s. And if somebody notices, then they're like, oh, that's not that's not period correct garb or <laughs> or or there's some kind of technology that's if you're making a 70s conspiracy thriller and someone would be using, say, a Motorola Razor phone or something. No, nope, those phones weren't there at the time. But that extends even further, like are are the way a movie is shot. Do you believe that the way are, are, are your actors believable? Um, and I think that to create that kind of a reality that we believe in, that's when movies are able to get underneath our skin and they can scare us or elate us or move us, make us cry. Uh, and, and that's not to say, like even in a science fiction film or a horror film, when you're dealing with unreality, like for instance, the original Star Wars. The original Star Wars was so groundbreaking at the time because it felt real. It was a science fiction film that's showing us robots and spaceships and creatures and things we'd never seen before, death stars, and yet everything in it, you you buy. You believe that that really is happening a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So verisimilitude isn't just about uh, recreating reality. It's about creating a reality within the frame that you can believe in even if it's in the far flung future or the distant past. So that's why somebody called me the Viceroy of Verisimilitude because I'm always I'm always talking about that because I think that's that's something that's really hard to achieve uh in film and I love it when it works. Yeah. And like especially in sci-fi and like horror like you said, those are two major aspects and you need to maintain that. But uh before we get into the nitty-gritty like mm. all those terms uh, like you're you're from Seattle. You're a Seattle kid, right, Robert? Yeah. And yep. you went to school at USC. If, to yeah, my knowledge, I started it, out at the Evergreen State College, which is a local okay. college. It had some problems back in 2017, and then I went there because they had a great arts program. So it's a I call it crunchy, chewy granola because it was very liberal arts, tree hugging. You know, <laughs> it was very liberal. But I liked the fact that you could get your hands on cameras as soon as you got to the school. And then I, I transferred uh, my junior year. I transferred to USC. And it's it's not like that at USC. Like, you can't get your hands on cameras right away? Like no. USC is very structured. And the, okay. the programs are are very – I mean, they were – That was I was there a long time ago. I'm sure there probably still are. But one of the things at USC when I was there is they kind of wanted to instill – what it was like to actually work in the industry in their students by making things difficult. There was a process you had to go through and approvals and, but still, I mean, there was a lot of opportunity there. What I really liked about USC was the specificity of it. You could take a camera class and you can take one of the things that I took when I was at USC was a film editing course. And I realized that I, I had a certain adept adeptness to, to editing. And it's something that has served me well ever since. So, yeah, yeah, it, it's awesome that it, was that was that move hard for you to L.A. because oh no it, it, no it wasn't at all no I I wanted to move to L.A. I mean I wanted to make movies 
pretty much my whole life. And okay. while I was in Seattle, what was really interesting is I was old enough. I was sort of at the dawn of the home video era. And starting when I was 13, I started working in video stores when there weren't any. You know, no one had, I was the first, one of the first people I knew that had a VCR. And my grandfather had a furniture store, so he was able to get, he had an electronics department, was able to get me one at cost. So there was no one else. I was like the first kid on the block with uh, access to a, a VCR. And it really started off, um, I became very serious about my film education because suddenly I could watch movies and like movies that were on late night television that I couldn't normally see because my parents would let me stay up. I could time shift them and record them. And I started reading lots of film books and tracking movies down. And as movies were released on home video, things I'd never seen before, foreign films or classic movies I just hadn't run across, I was able to watch them. So I was pretty like I I couldn't wait to um to get out of Washington State and move to California really? and move to Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah. And I did. I just picked up one day uh, it was time for me to go. I put everything I owned. I lived in the same house my whole life. And then I just packed up all my stuff. I, I had a trailer hitch put on the back of my Toyota Supra. And I, everything I owned was in the trailer. I hooked it up and never looked back. Do you have any advice for some filmmakers, like the Kent State students who might be watching? Like, oh, man. It might not be as easy as you, but like about moving to <clears throat> L.A. or Atlanta or like all these other like uh, major film headquarters of the United yeah. States. I mean, they're the, like Atlanta. I, I think what's really amazing now that we didn't have back in the old days is the technology that's available to everybody, both to make movies and to display films. For instance, right now uh, on my YouTube channel, I am throwing what I'm calling the first intergalactic imagination connoisseurs film festival. And it was just something I came up with as a result of uh, two of my viewers, uh, Patrick Keller and Dieter Bastian, these filmmakers in Saarbrücken, Deutschland, Germany, one day just made a film. You know, it was a fun, it was kind of a lark. It was a fun thing that they did. And when I showed it on the, my YouTube channel, I'm like, we should have a film festival, you know, and just as a thing. And I'm like, I think we're going to do that. And I literally made it up on the fly. And by the way, you can still enter through December 1st. Um, and, and it's supposed to poster. It's a poster competition, and also a yeah. We had the we had the poster competition okay. to design a poster for the festival, but now it's the actual films. Okay. And awesome. I've been getting films in from literally all over the world, and uh, that's what I what I love now is like literally, like the new iPhone 12. The the cameras and the new iPhone 12 are are incredible, and if you want to get peripherals like other lenses and things like that, it's amazing the kind of technology. Like when I first started making movies, when I was like nine you know i had a super eight we we're shooting on super eight film so you you'd get a three and a half minute cartridge of super eight film you would shoot it and then you had to drop it off at this place called photomat which were these little like small buildings that were in like supermarket parking lots and that's where everybody would drop their film off now it seems so crazy because so it's like a uh, like a photo developer yeah like it was a, a, a photo map okay. was that's exactly what it was and i've you, never heard of it okay yeah you draw it had a yellow roof and you had to drop your 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 three minutes three and a half minutes of super eight film and it would take like a week you know and you'd get it back and you'd string it up on the projector and you wonder wow i wonder if anything i shot's in focus or was there enough light because you're just looking through the camera there was no video assist or anything like that and and then you know, it was all reversal, so it's not like you're going to go back and cut your negative. You, you you just get the reversal film, and then I had a little editor and a, a, a razor blade, and you use this tape to tape up the – to edit your stuff. And, and like, I was making movies with my uh, Star Wars action figures or <laughs> other models, and we, my friends and I, we blow stuff up with firecrackers. I mean, that was – anytime we could film something that was on fire or exploding, we would we would do that. And, and it was, this was even before video cameras. And then when everybody got started to get video cameras in, it, it, they didn't look good. I mean, I didn't like video cameras. It seemed like there was just less discipline. I'm like, no, you have to, we have to shoot film because you only had three and a half minute reels and they better be good. You better know what you're doing with videotape. You just, if you didn't like it, you just re-record it. And I always thought there was no <laughs> discipline there, but um, it was it, nowadays you're, you're carrying around a supercomputer in your pocket. And not only can you make movies, I mean, 
editorial software, sound mixing. You can write your scores on GarageBand, you know, and, yeah. and all, all so many other musical programs. And and then you've got Pro Tools to mix the sound. I I um I uh I've just finished producing and editing, uh, post supervising, and and I was the visual effects producer on this feature film called Tango Shalom that's going to start playing festivals in February. And one of the things that I did, I was using Final Cut, uh, Final Cut X or Final Cut Pro, whatever, and I did a whole temporary 5.1 sound mix. So when we were watching the film over to see how it played, we we played it in the theater and for a few people, and it had a full 5.1 mix. And that was that wasn't even professionally mixed. That's just what I did, quick and dirty. And it's amazing to me that nowadays you you literally can do all of these things and then you have the added benefit of if you want you can put them up on vimeo you can put them up on youtube and you know you look at some people's youtube channels they'll put up a, a video that'll get a million views you know if you're yeah. if you're somebody like like there's there's an automotive channel that i watch this guy the strad man he's in his mid-20s he puts up a video and within a day he's got a million views or davy 504 who's a youtuber i watch he, he plays the bass guitar he'll throw up a video and a million people will watch his videos like three times a week now i'm not saying you know it takes years to build up that kind of a following yeah. but the fact is you can put up a movie on youtube and suddenly there's an audience that's available to you um around the planet earth and it's unbelievable it's just unbelievable to me that the technology that we have now and it's just a question of you know if people want to become filmmakers or digital artists there's never been a better time there's never been a better time in history to to live because of all the amazing tools that you have at your disposal do you find yourself a bit jealous like <laughs> if you would have grown up like in today's generation like you would have had all these tools to maybe not get a head start, but develop your craft even younger and find um, your yeah. like, language. I, I mean, I wouldn't say that I was I was jealous, but yeah, I, I like the fact that I'm alive now because I too can avail myself, you know, of these tools and I use them all the time. I mean, this computer that I'm talking to you on now, I edited short films, feature films, I've edited uh, music videos on, and I broadcast my YouTube show every day. I'm talking to you on the same computer. It's all in the same box. And it's yeah. it's amazing with all the different software and all the different things you can do. I mean, I literally, I edit stuff every day. It doesn't so I'm editing something all the time. Then I'll go onto YouTube and talk to people live. Like right now we're having a live conversation. You're in Pittsburgh, I'm in pasadena and and this is it's it's astonishing that we have this kind of technology at our at, at our fingertips and i think yeah. that you know if i was a kid i really do i would have started making like i would have made my first feature when i was 12 you know i would have been one of these kids i'm like you know what you know these tiktok videos they're not enough for me i'm gonna go make a feature i mean that's what i would have done because it cost so much money when i was a kid to buy film you know, and to develop, to develop it. Well, now it costs nothing. You know, you have somebody buy you a nice iPhone 12 and you're, you're, you're off to the races or, you know, DSLR cameras. And there's so much incredible stuff. And I yeah. think I'll, I'll tell you one thing though. I don't necessarily think that it used, it's, it's just like when I was a kid, anybody who wanted to could pick up a guitar and start a rock band. But not every kid did, you know, because there's only a certain amount of people that are really interested in doing something in the arts and making movies is a is a hard, long. I mean, making TikTok videos is one thing or making videos for Instagram. But if you're going to make a feature film, uh, there's a lot more time involved. And I yeah. don't with all this technology, I don't think it's necessarily led to. Well, that's not true. I think I think it has led to more more people creating, let's call it digital art, online content, because look at how much content there is. But in terms of like narrative film, I don't necessarily know if <clears throat> there's as many people getting into that nowadays, because still getting into motion pictures, feature length motion pictures and television is still relatively difficult. It's not, it's not easy, but there's going to come a time pretty soon where people are going to, Kid, some kid's going to make his own television series and he's going to put it up on YouTube or she's going to put it up on YouTube. 
or if they're they or there, they're not he or she, but whoever they identify as, they're going to make their show and they're going to put it up. And they're going to do 10 episodes of it. And they're going to have some friend of theirs that's an incredible VFX artist and another friend of theirs that's an incredible uh, musician who's going to write the score. And somebody's going to create a, a TV show that is completely um, soup to nuts made in someone's backyard and it's going to catch on fire and the whole world is going to watch it. And then we're going to be in a whole new realm. And I think that, and what's so great is there's enough room for everybody. You know, there's billions of people on this planet. So I also feel that I, I, I'm not in competition with anybody anymore. Um, Cause you can, if you want, depends what you, what you're trying to do, but you've got the own, you've got your own distribution method. You can get the word out. You can do all kinds of things. And it's just, it just requires innovation. And I think that's yeah. exciting. Yeah, like you say, we all have our own unique voices and you want that to be heard, like how you close all your episodes. Yeah. Uh, and we're hearing more voices now. And, and talking about smartphones, I I have my own DSLR, but I have a hard time, like I since I have my smartphone, I have a hard time just getting away from that because it's just such a useful tool and oh. it doesn't look that bad. So, uh, and just so user-friendly. So I have to kind of pry myself away from that when just, uh, just trying to make like short films for class and stuff just to try to use a more professional gear. But uh, yeah, like you said, it, anyone can do it. <laughs> you know, and, and I'll tell you something. The difference is when you're using um, uh, professional gear, there's a discipline with uh, professional gear. There's a discipline that you need, uh, but that doesn't, it shouldn't stop you. If you're just going to use a camera on your phone, you can still, um, you know, make some great, great material. It really is all about your eye. Like, how are you going to frame things? How are you going to tell your story? There's a lot of things that you can do. And a lot of people get hung up on the fact that they might not have the kind of gear that David Fincher is using from Mank, his new movie, for instance. But I don't think you need to. I think, you know, um, if the content, if what you're shooting is well shot and interesting, um, then I think you've got something. You should never let, if you've got a camera, you know, if you've got like, uh, I, I just, I, I, I marvel at this, this is an iPhone 11, but I mean, I marvel at the fact that if you hold a camera like this and you can hold it steady, you know, and you've got, you, you, your hand can be a great dolly, you can, you can yeah. uh, shoot some amazing stuff. Yeah, and I don't think it, it don't let don't let your lack of gear ever get in the way of making something. Yeah, uh, it, it, it looks great just how it is, especially for photos. But uh, video is get, it's getting there for just a small device like that. Uh, while I was uh, researching your like early work, Robert, uh, for the show, uh, I, I didn't know that you were a PA on Leatherface, uh, the, the third <laughs> film. And Leatherface, I, the Texas Chainsaw <laughs> Massacre 3. I, yeah. I, have a, I have a soft spot for all those films just because I love the first one so much. And yeah, I, I can uh, just... the first one's a masterpiece. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, and then the third one, and Viggo Mortensen's in it, which yep. uh, I love him. So uh, how'd you, like, after USC, uh, you earn your degree from there. And then how'd you become a PA on... I heard film in a pretty big <laughs> series. Well, like, it, that it, work? It, it was very, it's very interesting. Um, so there's a couple of things that happened. When I, when I was at USC, we had a class. It was taught by Max Lamb and it was called the visiting artists seminar. And it was on Tuesday nights and it was only a two credit course. And Max Lamb would bring working industry professionals just into the class. And they would speak for three hours. And there was only like 15 people in the class. And what I would do is I would thoroughly research. I mean, this is before the internet existed. So I usually had to go to the Motion Picture Academy library where they had all these newspaper clippings or clippings from Variety and The Hollywood Reporter about whatever, whatever person was going to speak. And I would do research and I would come up with questions because I figured if you have industry professionals coming to your class and you have them for three hours, I mean, and you can ask them anything. Well, I wasn't going to let that opportunity slide. So there were two producers, Mark Levinson and Scott Rosenfeld, that came uh, uh, at the time. And they had produced a science fiction movie called Stranded. 
and that uh, a guy named Rocco Joffrey, who was an effects artist, had worked on that I had known. And they also produced Mystic Pizza, which was at the time Julia Roberts's first film. And so I, um, when they were there, I, I did all this, again, research. And when they were speaking, I just kept raising my hand. And of course, not a lot of students would do that research. So they didn't have a lot to say. And, and all I did was ask questions. And eventually it almost became like I was interviewing them for the class. You know, and Max Lamb's like, yeah, keep going, keep going. And they called Max Lamb the next day and they gave me a job. They gave wow. me my first job in the industry. And it was funny because it wasn't, uh, it was Scott Rosenfeld's wife who said, you should hire that kid. And it was only because I had done the prep work uh, and and I, it's it's a lesson that I cannot uh, impart enough, which is work begets work. You know, if you do the work uh, and you make something happen, now I'm not saying it's always going to happen, but if you do the work and you've created something or you've done uh, prep work for an interview like you have for the interview with me, you, you never know where it's going to lead. And, and, and so often, I mean, yes, you have to be proactive. But so anyway, so these guys gave me my first job. Now, through these kinds of jobs, like when you're answering phones, because basically what I was doing was great. What I did for them was I became uh, what's called a story analyst. I was a script reader. So they would get hundreds of screenplays in from writers. And I'd never really, I'd read a few screenplays, but I'd never read screenplays with an eye toward actually seeing them get made. Mark Levinson and Scott Rosenfeld had also produced Teen Wolf. So they had done Mystic Pizza, Teen Wolf, Stranded. So they had some movies underneath their belts. And, you know, when I suddenly you start meeting people, you know, talking to them. And, and, and when you're in LA and you start doing things in the industry, uh, you just start meeting people. And so working with Mark and Scott, I was talking to people I didn't know, or people would come into the office and I'd be like, Hey, how you doing? And eventually, it was a, a woman I knew, actually a woman I knew from a long time ago, but she somehow found herself working on Leatherface. And she calls me up and she goes, oh, and uh, Mark, Le so I worked for them until they, they their deal was up with Atlantic releasing. So then, you know, my time was over and they were going to see where they were going to go. But I got this job. I got this job and um, I got a phone call from this woman. She's like, hey, have you ever worked on... Um, a movie set before and i said no <laughs> i've never worked on a movie set before and she's like well you know uh, people seem to like you and you know could you come in and, and and interview with the art department they're looking for a production assistant i didn't even know what movie it was but being a lifelong science fiction fantasy and horror movie fan you know i i said well what's the movie and she goes well it's leatherface and texas chainsaw massacre three and i'm like what <laughs> are you kidding me you know and i i go in there and i met um mick strawn who is the production designer and at the time, that was a New Line movie. And New Line had Mick and CJ Strawn. They were brothers and sisters, brother and sister. And they would go, one would design one movie and another would design another. So they were doing like the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. Like they were just finishing up a Nightmare on Elm Street 5. And so when I started, I got to go watch some of Nightmare uh, 5 being filmed, which was awesome. Because it was all the same kind of, the same art department where it was being shared. So I go in and I got the job and it was, it was brutal. I mean, it was what we did on the, on the art department is basically in charge of everything that you see on screen that is inhabited by the actors. And in the case of Leatherface, we built from scratch a gas station and then a giant farmhouse that was in the woods behind Magic Mountain, which is a big amusement park. Uh, just north of Los Angeles. So it was amazing. And then we're all the blood and the gore. And it was so much fun. Like the first day I was on the job, they gave me $10,000 in cash and a list of stuff I needed to buy. And they're like, don't come back until you have everything on this list. And I'm like, but uh, that was it. It was almost like a test. And one of the, one of the things that I had to go buy was don't mess with Texas bumper stickers. Well, we're in California, you know, I'm like, <laughs> but I'm, I, I certainly was not going to uh, come back. Empty down, yeah. 
So I'm like, okay, well, where would they? And I'm, I'm thinking, where who would even have a "Don't mess with Texas" bumper sticker on on their vehicle? And I'm like, well, truckers. So I found the there was a truck stop that was about 20 miles away from our production office. And I'm like, it was a big truck stop. And I'm like, man, I'm gonna go there. So I did. You know, I went and and they had not only did they have a one bumper sticker, but they had like five different designs or something, three different designs, and I just bought them all. I bought all, because on a movie you always want to give people choices, and then I had to go get a bunch of other stuff. I mean, it was pretty cool. Like there were things like they asked if there's a meat hook in a human's torso, and the meat, the, the how how would they move the the how would you know like in a butcher shop you have things that go the big giant hooks and they're hanging from the walls and or the ceiling, and I got to like use my imagination and go buy all that stuff like go to supply houses and find all this and i would just bring back all of this stuff and they're like "Ooh, this is cool so i actually got to be creative in a way by being a production assistant and some days i would have to go get water and soda for the crews that were building the the sets or i would have to somebody would say can you help us build we're building a, a dead body that is comes apart can you help us and i'm like yes i can <laughs> and and it was it was a fantastic experience because not only did I meet people like Vigo Mortensen and Ken Foray who starred in Dawn of the Dead, uh, which was amazing to meet uh, him, but it was just seeing how a movies made and I'm you know you're on set all day long too so not only we were working like weeks I think probably six weeks before the movie even started shooting because we had to build everything and then yeah. um, to actually be on set every day it was it was amazing we were shooting at night I mean there's a chainsaw battle in this in this body pit i mean it's amazing it was so much fun like what are you doing yeah. tonight oh we're gonna we're gonna chainsaw off ken foray's face that didn't even make they had to cut they cut that out of the movie but it was yeah, an amazing effect yeah yeah because he lived they changed they, they the, they changed them, the yeah. script but that chainsaw it was it literally cut off it was awesome it was awesome yeah. i loved it did you get the whole the golden chainsaw rob that the golden chainsaw you mean that was in the trailer for the the saw and family? i think it was in the very end too or something the one, or... i never did yeah i i no? did not hold the golden chainsaw no um but i don't think i think that was because there was reshoots the problem with yeah. that movie was what happened was new line thought yeah we're gonna have a we're gonna have a another franchise like a nightmare on elm street what they didn't realize is a nightmare on elm street has a a, a big fantasy component to it it's it's fun. You know, Freddy yeah. Krueger is cracking jokes and, and Johnny Depp gets sucked into a bed and spewed out onto the ceiling. But with Leatherface, you're dealing with a realistic family of cannibals that kill and eat human beings. There isn't, there isn't the fun fantasy element that, say, Freddy Krueger brought to the proceedings. So when the movie was finished, they had a really hard time with the ratings board. Um, they, the movie was rated X like four or five times and they they kept having to cut uh parts out of it and there was a little girl in the film who's she was great and there was a lot of stuff with her in it that was i sat next to her at the premiere and there was a lot of stuff of her cut out of the movie um like when she was helping kill people and it was it did not sit well with the ratings board but what people don't understand is when you're making horror films they're hilarious to make and all the, the visual effects. And like when she came over and she pulls a thing where a sledgehammer came down and hit one of the characters in the head, killing him. And then she fills a cup full of blood and takes it over to her <laughs> family to drink. You know, that's fun and hilarious when you're shooting it. But on camera, it's a little kid killing somebody and drinking their blood. Then you've crossed a line. So they had a, a real problem with that. But, but I'll tell you one thing. That summer, it was the summer of 1989. I had wow. so much fun. I mean, it was, I was exhausted. I was working six days a week, like 20 hour days, but it didn't matter. Cause it was, it was like, I'm like, I've made it. I'm a PA on a horror film. I could die and go to heaven and I will have accomplished my goal. And my name's in the end credits. You know, that awesome. was some, something yeah. else. My dad called me up and he goes, I went, I went and saw your movie. And then he's like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see your movie. I just waited and saw the end credits just so I could see your name roll up. And I'm like, <laughs> Wow, Dad, that was really I'm I'm touched. Thank you very much. But that was, I mean, it was a thrill seeing that movie at the Chinese Theater in Hollywood on Hollywood Boulevard and watching the credits roll and see my name in, in the credits. It was like, oh my God. You know. Yeah. 
and they're filming the like sixth, fifth or sixth one right now in like Bulgaria. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I don't think I could ever pee on that in Bulgaria. But no, I wish I could do something like that someday. Although I did, like you know, I produced time. a I, I produced a horror film in Bulgaria. The, the, the Hills Run Red. Hills Run Red. Yeah, yeah, and we we had some expat Americans that were our PAs. You know, people, because there's a lot of production in Bulgaria. So there's a lot of, there was, there was two major studios over there, UFO and New Boyana. So you never know. You might find yourself in Bulgaria. You just never know. I'd be up for it. It just, I, I was always told just stay away from Eastern Europe or Western Eastern Europe, but I don't know. It's if they're filming stuff there, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's safe then safer. Yeah. You know, I mean it's it can be a little crazy but i loved bulgaria uh sofia okay. where we were it the, the city was beautiful the people in bulgaria were great they were so nice and no one parties harder than bulgarians man <laughs> um but but the cruise it was really interesting because there was like five different languages spoken on set i felt like i was on the smartest movie set ever because wow. it was so worldly you know there's wow you we had italian our production designer was italian our our line producers were Israeli. And then we had people from all over Europe that were speaking different languages. And of course, obviously Bulgarian. And it was, it was, um, it's a lot of fun. My Mark Altman, who I made for enterprise with has been doing his TV series, Pandora. They're shooting it in Bulgaria, uh, with the same studio that I worked on with, uh, Hills Run Red, uh, back in 2008. Yeah. So, that's one that I have to put on my list because just, I don't know. Is it? Would you just say it's your like average slasher, or does it? Because I, I don't know much about the Hills Run uh, Red. The Hills Run. No, I think it's more of a meta. It's meta, it's okay. kind of a meta commentary on on horror movies in general. Okay. And it, it's basically about these two kids, documentarians, kind of like me and Dave Parker, who made it. <laughs> we made DVD special feature documentaries or Blu-ray documentaries, and it's about these two kids that are in search of this lost film. This director. Wilson Weiler can Cannon who made this movie, the Hills run red. That's supposed to be the scariest thing ever. And they want to find out where did he disappear to and where is this film and can they find it? And when they finally meet him, it turns out that it's real. It, 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 yeah. He's been killing people for real because that's what he believes art is. And, and he has a, a child born of incest with his own daughter who cut off his own face and sewed a, a baby's mask on his face. And it's, it's pretty hardcore and it turns out that they've never stopped making movies and it kind of goes from there. But it's funny. I recently showed it to my girlfriend and she was not happy with me. <laughs> it was, it's, it, it doesn't have the kind of fantasy element that makes it fun. It's pretty hardcore. Yeah. Well, it sounds like something I'd love. I should have, I should have talked to you before uh, Halloween. It could have been at my Halloween film. Oh but... yeah. <laughs> well, you uh, know, I used to say this on my show, the bl Blu-ray of the Hills on red came out in June from scream factory and we did do we made six and a half hours of new special features so the movie's only like 83 minutes long but there's like a total of i think nine hours of special features on the disc so it's the most self-indulgent blu-ray special features package ever but it's fun <laughs> and you made the special features i assume yeah that's your specialty okay yeah i mean it was funny because when the movie was so low budget but we made it with warner brothers and producer joel silver's um dark castle entertainment but they weren't gonna you know they didn't hire a dvd crew or anything so i just took my own equipment and not only was i producing the movie but i was running around doing interviews with the cast and shooting every day and there were there were tapes that i hadn't touched in 12 years that i've been just hauling around and when they decided they they were when they announced they were going to do the the blu-ray we kind of contacted scream factory and said hey you know, we got all this material that no one's ever done anything with. Can we make something for the disc? And they're like, great. Yes, do that. And they gave us a little bit of a budget and we we, we were off to the races. So that, that was cool. But awesome. I think the lesson is, you know, that work begets work. If you, 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 you're never going to get anywhere if you don't have work to show people. And I think nowadays, if you want to make films, I mean, you can even... I always tell people like, well, what am I going to make a film about? And I'm always like, you know what? Do you have a dog or a cat? Do you have a pet? And I'm like, if you have a pet, make a movie like the many moods of your animal, you know, whatever. And, and spend a week shooting your, your pet doing whatever the cat jumping around the dog, walking the dog, making funny faces, whatever you want to do and shoot a bunch of footage and then cut that footage together and then find a piece of music 
and put that music over the footage. And with the footage, you can use slow-mo and, and try and find moments where the, the animal might show emotion or something and cut it together and make, make a three minute short video, you know, and, 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 and suddenly you start learning about camera angles and you'll be like, Oh, I wish, I wish I had this angle from over here. I wish the dog ran this way instead of that way. And suddenly, and you do a couple of those and suddenly you're a filmmaker, you know, and, you throw those up on on YouTube. I mean, always you can always get people to watch cat and dog videos. And if you don't use licensed uh, or, or or music that if you make your own music in GarageBand and you own it all, you never know. Some someday you're gonna have fifty thousand views of your dog, your funny dog video, and now you're a filmmaker. You know, you get your channel monetized, and you're off to the races. Yeah, there's some weird channels out there. You can anything can work, but. Uh... I mean, if you're, you're like a, if you, if you grow flowers and you could make time-lapse flower videos, I swear to God, people would watch them. Like you, 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 you grow a garden, you know? Yeah. I mean, I would literally watch a time-lapse video of a garden, but you'd have to have a camera mounted, you know, and, and have it shooting for weeks, months, for weeks yeah. and cut it all together. You know, it's like people who do those, those selfie videos, one man or one woman takes a selfie every day for five years, you know, and they do those montages and you, you watch them. I'm mesmerized by that. I, I don't know who the first person who thought of doing that was, but I thought, well, that's a pretty genius idea. Taking the, yeah. basically the same picture of yourself for five years and you cut it all together and you've got a mesmerizing piece of video that people would watch. I mean, it's amazing what you can do and it's, and you just never know where it's going to lead. You know, you never know where, look at some people start making TikTok videos and look where they wind up, you know, they, they, yeah. they, they wind up on reality shows and things like that. So I know one thing though, I know if you don't make anything, you're not going to get anywhere. You know, yeah. you've, you've got to put yourself out there. You, you, and, and you know what, don't be afraid of, of what's the worst that can happen. I mean, if you make a bad movie, so what? Like Ed Wood said, like Johnny Depp is Ed Wood said in the movie, Ed Wood, well, my next one will be better, you know, and that's how you get better. You, you, you nowadays, everybody thinks that, well, I've made something. It has to be, it has to change the world. No, you know, it's, it can be a process. You might not make a movie that's any good that you like for five years, but if you don't start doing it, you know, how do you know? You, yeah. You got, you, that, that's kind of my thing. Cause I've made a few short films just on my own. And it, my goal this year was like, I can't stay to like have a crew and start like building and start growing the process. But that, that kind of got destroyed because of COVID and everything. But I, know. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I just, I kind of want to evolve as a filmmaker and it, I, I just don't, I don't know. It's hard for me to just keep it like this, like self, just me and myself creating my own stuff. But I, I, I do want to keep making stuff, but it, it's a process. Just like you said, and yeah. I'm, I'm determined just like you are and were, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested about your relationship with Bill Young. Cause I, I read about that on online, Bill Young and how, how you came into contact with him. And it, it seems like, uh, you met him after Texas Chainsaw. Yeah. Right? So, okay. This, this is another interesting thing that happened. Really? So Bill Young was the senior vice president of production at Warner brothers. Now what that means is there's, there's different senior vice presidents at a studio. A lot of them are in charge of what movies Warner brothers would make. So there's a lot of, when I was there, Jim Henson's daughter, Lisa Henson was there. And um, there were other producers like Tom LaSalle and Bob Brassel and Alan Stewart. So they were they would meet with writers and they would develop projects and meet with filmmakers and, and figure out like what movies are the studio going to make. Well, once that was decided, all those scripts and all that material came to our department because uh, we had to figure out how they were going to get made. So our department oversaw all of the movies that Warner Brothers made. So how I got that job was, again, I had met the producer of the Omen movies. Uh, he also produced The Lost Boys and The Goonies, uh, a movie, a guy named Harvey Bernard. And I had met him when I was in high school. He had brought Lady Hawk, his movie Lady Hawk, up to show. And I had got in there, some family friends like knew him. So I got to go to the screening of Lady Hawk, and I went up and met him. And I, I was just, I just was talking to him and, 
I, I kept that connection. Uh, I, I kept in touch with him and out of the blue, I had, he'd known I'd moved to LA. He calls me up, uh, and during the summer while I was working on, on Leatherface. And he says, uh, I've got an opportunity for you and I think you'd be perfect for it. And I'm like, I, I'm like, okay. He said, Bill Young at Warner brothers is, is going to be starting what, what he's calling a management trainee program. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. And he goes, well, he explains to me what Bill Young does and what this department at Warner Brothers does. And he goes, yeah, they they oversee, they keep track at the studio level of every movie that Warner Brothers is making. And it all filters through Bill's department. And I was like, that's like the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. And so he says, well, okay, well, I know Bill because he worked at Warner Brothers on on Lady Hawk and on Goonies and, and, and these other movies. And so... um he thought i guess bill probably called a bunch of people do you know anybody that is, and so i go in and i met i met uh with bill i went into warner brothers and it was like i'm literally on the warner brothers studio lot you know where all the where all the the sound stages are and i mean a lot of movies get made other places but so i get this i get the job and it was me a guy named john labib and another guy named jamie johnson and we were hired to be the first management trainees in feature production and basically it was just glorified pa work but i had an office in the executive i mean it was it was a it was an office that was actually it was a little hole in the wall that was actually behind where the coffee maker was but it was still an office in the executive wing of warner brothers so suddenly i was in in warner brothers and every day i had to go to the most important people's off at the time uh, Bob Daly and Terry Semmel ran the studio, and then uh, Mark Canton was there, and Bruce Berman was there. Still huge producers in Hollywood today. And I had to go into their offices every day and deliver what are called production reports and call sheets. Call sheets uh, have everybody that's working on a film the next day, and a production report is everything, that all the work that was done for that day. And they're distributed amongst the executives. So that's what I did. So I had to go into everyone's office, usually multiple times a day. And I'm like, you know, hey, how's it going? And every script that they were developing, I had access to everything. I mean, it was insane. And the thing is, I was such a fanatic, a movie fanatic. There, there wasn't people like me there. Everybody was very serious and business minded, but, but they weren't like, they were Ivy League educated business people for the most part. But as a movie fan, I'm like, oh my God, you know, you get in these scripts, like this is the script for Lethal Weapon 2. And, and it, I would... I would never leave. Like I would stay at night and I would wander the studio and go meet people. Like if they were building sets or something. And, and I, I met and I would find things that just, there was stuff lying around. Like for instance, there was one, one time there was a place called the mill and outside the mill, there was the scene dock where they had like flats, which are the walls for a set are called flats. And when they're done with a set, they usually take the flats and they store them. Well, there was this place where they had all these flats stored, this big building. And there was a bunch of other crates around there. And one day, and I'm just, because I was always digging around. Because nobody, nobody, you're on the lot. So people figure if you're on the lot, then you're supposed to be there. And and digging around where the flats are, like nobody does that. <laughs> and I, I find this box, this huge crate. And on the side was spray painted CE3K which I knew exactly was Close Encounters of the Third Kind because Warner Brothers and Columbia used to share a lot and Close Encounters was a Columbia film. So I look at this and I pried off the top and it was the miniature landscape of Devil's Tower, which is where the mothership yeah. lands. I mean, it's this huge, just huge miniature that Greg Jean built. It had been sitting there for 12 years. Like this box had been sitting there probably since they shot Close Encounters, and there was a few other boxes of other landscape scenes right out of the movie. And I'm like, but nobody cared because once they're done with that, you know, they put it away and no one's got room for it. They got to move that stuff out for the next movie. So it, the, being on the studio lot was I every day, like one day I found the time machine from Nicholas Meyer's movie, uh, Time After Time, that I loved. And it was it was it's beautiful and then one day somebody took it down and and repainted it horribly to use in some music video and i would get pissed i was like how can i liberate this stuff and it got to the point where i knew so much about the lot that 
I started would would like I'll give you an example. When we were making a movie called Bonfire of the Vanities, uh, actress Melanie Griffith's uh, assistant calls up Bill's office and says, "Is there anybody that can take uh, her uh, her kids on a tour of the lot?" So Bill Bill Young's office, his his um, assistant Nancy would call me and go, "Hey Bob, Rob, um, could you give a tour to?" Melanie Griffith and Don Johnson's kids. And I'm like, okay. And um, so then I would. And I think one of them, one of the people that I was giving a tour to was Dakota Johnson, who was an infant. Wow. And so then I would do things like, you know, I'm taking these kids around and the nanny. And we had just finished making Gremlins 2. So there was a lockup. There was a lockup on the lot that had $3 million worth of Gremlins, all the miniature Gremlins they used for the movie that were on the lot. Why well, had keys to all of that stuff? So I would just be like, if no one was looking, you know, I'd go grab the keys and then I would go open up the locker. I mean, they had like a full, a gizmo head that would fit over this giant gizmo head that had all the wires that would make the, the mechanisms of the eyes to like widen and stuff. And of course this was, this is always what would happen to me. So I would, I would, I would do this and take the kids and I would tell the nanny, I'm like, look, don't tell anybody that we went into the gremlins lockup because no one's going to appreciate the fact that I'm just availing myself of $3 million worth of gremlins, because if they make gremlins three, which by the way, they never did, but if they're going to make gremlins three, I, I'll, I don't want to, I don't want to get in trouble. I would say that. And then of course that night I would get called in to Bill Young's office and, and Bill, uh, I, I had to go answer phones for him at, at six 30 every night when his assistant left, but he would stay till like eight. So he calls me to his office a little early and he goes, so Melanie Griffith called me today. She was very happy. Can you imagine why she called me very happy today? I'm like, no. Well, her kids had a wonderful time. They had a wonderful time with, with you and the nanny just couldn't, couldn't speak highly enough. And he goes, it's really great when our talent, you know, our, our A-list movie talent is really happy. And if we here in the physical production office, if we can make those people happy, well, then I'm happy. And then he says, if you ever go into that gremlins lockup again, you'll never work in this town again. So, I mean, he was tongue in cheek, but it was always it was always that kind of thing because nobody else cared, really. But for me, yeah. it was like being a kid in a candy store every single day. Like, oh, there's the Batmobile you know, or something. And, and it was, it was, can I drive that? And you, you just never knew. And, and because everybody loved, uh, loved when you came around, if you were really enthusiastic and you knew what they were doing, like I'm, I had to go like here today, uh, Clint Eastwood's office, his company, Malpaso, uh, Malpaso, which is still there, not Paso, but Paso, Malpaso, you know, it's one day it's like, uh, you got to go to Clint Eastwood's office and pick something up. I'm like, okay. And invariably you would run into Clint Eastwood. And, and you, you introduce yourself. You had to be cool about it, but it, because people thought if you're coming from the physical, if you're coming from Bill Young's office, well, you're legit. And if I was a fan, you still had to be able to, you had to be like, Mr. Eastwood, it's, it's a great pleasure to meet you, sir. I'm really looking forward to seeing the rookie. That was the movie they were making when I was there, the Charlie Sheen and Clint Eastwood movie. And it was the first time the Mercedes 500 model came out and they drove it out of a building there's an action scene where they drive it out of a building very fast and furious like, but it was, it was like for me being 22, 23 years old, it was, it was like, I, it was the greatest thing in the world. It was a great, and it was great. Cause like, if you were dating somebody, you know, if you're seeing a girl, you could be like, why don't you come have lunch at the studio? <laughs> uh, I got thrown off the set of Rocky five. <laughs> what were you doing rob well i was i, I was just watching like where oh. they were filming the, the the fight was close to where my car was parked you know i had to walk across the studio a lot i did it every day well so my car was like here and there was this these new york buildings that were like here and they were filming the fight with tommy gunn when uh, like when he comes out of this diner or whatever and i just walked over and and was watching you know but i clearly wasn't part of the crew i'm just sitting there watching because you know, and the the first AD said uh, comes over and goes, "Um, who are you?" And I would I would always say, "I'm Rob Burnett. I'm from feature uh, Warner Brothers feature production." Well, this wasn't a Warner Brothers movie, so of course I get reported. 
you know, <laughs> they, they, he tells me I have to leave the set, but then they would follow up and I would get, I would get Bill Young would get the call. Like, uh, and, and he would say things like, don't you ever go home? And I'm like, why would I go home when they're making movies on this studio lot 24 hours a day? You know, you just never knew what you were going to, going to go see like, Oh, today we're shooting the storm sequence in Joe versus the volcano and Tom Hanks and uh, Meg Ryan are working. I'm like, I think I'm gonna go see that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was just, it was for me, it was, it was like being in Nirvana. I mean, it was, yeah. their their tolerance is just so high, I guess. Like it's just another daily occurrence, but for someone 22, 23, that's what you've been looking forward to. So, I mean, it was, it was incredible. It was just, it was, and I can't tell you, I only wish now here's a bit of advice. I only wish I was a little bit more pro. I wasn't ready to write a screenplay and make the movie, but here I was, I, I, I was, a, I had anybody that I needed to meet that, that was a world-class filmmaker. I was having so much fun being a movie fan working at the studio. I never thought to myself, I should get a screenplay and I should use all of these people that I know to produce my first film. And I just was too, there was, there was too much fun to be had. And I, I can't blame myself for it, but it, 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 if I had a regret in my life, that would be the regret. I've often thought that if I had a time machine, I would take the original screenplay for free enterprise and I would go back in time to 1990 when I was working at Warner brothers and I would make it eight years before we made it. And I would use the entire studio infrastructure to help get it made because it would have been, it would have been great. I would have had all the, the best people in the world to make it, but you know, you're 22, 23. How mature are you really? I wasn't, but I, I really wish that I was a little bit more less of a fanboy at that time and more of a businessman. Well, it's but it's I, a balance, but of course I feel yeah, the same way now out at a point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you it can't was, lose that fanboy. You're still that fanboy. Yeah. So. I, I was going to say it hasn't gone away, but, but yeah. I would have been more successful. I think in my career, if I would have buckled down a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, just like uh, you're still successful in your career and in just a different way, I'd say, because we have all these people in the chat, just kind of, you have your little uh, groupies, I'd say a little <laughs> bit like, uh, and they're following you from all your work and on, they're on the stream right now. And some of those people are from the John Campia show. Yeah. And staying, like, and how important do you think that is to stay up to date? Because the John Campia show is mostly a film news show. And yeah, just following the daily occurrences in the film industry, and that's kind of just like you were doing when you were younger, just uh, oh. following all those new. Like, it, I guess it's kind of a different way of following all those new projects. Like, you're not on set at the Warner Brothers uh, set, but you're just following everything around the world with just discussing with Campia. So, yeah, how important do you think that is for like someone my age or all filmmakers just to well, stay? I- I don't necessarily know if following movie news is important yeah. if you want to be a filmmaker. I think what's most important is to make films. Yeah. And and the the idea that filmmaking is a craft, like one of the things that I did that I highly recommend is after I left Warner Brothers, I started actually working at a low-budget film company called Full Moon Entertainment. And I met an actor there who was getting into post-production named Peter Billingsley who started a movie called A Christmas Story. He was also an executive producer of, of the first Iron Man for the MCU. But wow. one of the things we started doing was we started making anything we could, industrial films, music videos, and anything we could, we'd go do you, to like local restaurants. Do you want us to make a commercial for public access TV for you? So we just started making stuff. We didn't know, we didn't really have, we would do anything. Anything that involved filming, we would go out and do it. And we worked for like the Department of Transportation here in California. We did all kinds of stuff. And that was just to learn our craft. Like, and it helped you learn logistics. Like, how do you plan a shoot? How do you get all the gear involved? You know, renting things, getting the insurance. I mean, we found out a lot of stuff that we needed to do. And it was, it was all, it all was a result of actually working. You know, we were, we learned on the job. Like, for instance, um, we, through a really interesting set of circumstances, we ended up working, re-editing a movie called Arcade. And it was a low-budget uh, movie that Full Moon put out about kids who get sucked into a video game. Kind of a Tron ripoff. Now, we ed- ended up getting it, uh, able to re-edit that whole film. 
and it was funny. It was written by David Goyer, who wrote a lot of the Dark Knight stuff for for Christopher Nolan. So we were recutting this whole movie, and we were in charge of the entire post production on the film. Well, we didn't know everything about post production, so we would we would ask, we would learn on the job, you know, and and we we would always kind of accept um, jobs that were a little above us that we didn't quite know how to do them. But we never said no. We would figure out on the job. And and sometimes, you know, Peter and I would be like, I don't know if we're going to pull this off. And we'd be like, meh, we'll pull it off. We'll figure out what to do. And so we were we were constantly doing those kinds of things and, um, you know, learning on the job, which was which was great. And invariably, one those jobs would lead to something else. Like somebody would be like, ah, I saw your music video. Can you make a video for my band? And you'd we'd be like, yeah, sure. And 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 that's that's that was really helpful. Yeah. And I like how you said full moon because in free enterprise, I think it's full eclipse. Full eclipse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, there's a lot of stories that, that there's a lot of stuff in free enterprise that was inspired by the days at full moon and working. It was funny because full moon made like the subspecies movies and the demonic toys movies and the, um, uh, oh, uh okay. trancers they... and puppet, the puppet master movies. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That was all. And we were making a movie a month. So it was wow. that was another great place to work. I mean, it's like, what do you want to do today? Do you want to do you want to go paint sets or do you want to go be in the visual effects department or what do you want to do? And and it was great. It was a great place yeah. to work. I'd love to I wish I wish I mean, if I could do anything, I would love to set up a full moon. Like I like what Blumhouse, Jason Blum has has done with his horror uh brand, but I would love to set up like a full moon and and whether you're making movies for say Shutter or Netflix and make like $5 million or less movies and just make one every two months. Cause at full moon, we were doing a movie a month and we had an output deal through Paramount home video. And it was amazing. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, people like, you know, David Goyer was there and, and um, uh, Michael Davis who directed this movie, shoot him up. He started there. And there's a lot of people like how James Gunn started at trauma, you know, when he did Tromeo and Juliet it was a great way to break in and, and having that kind of assembly line when you're making movies so quickly and, and making them every month, every day, it was a great opportunity to learn. And I would love, like if I could set something, if I had the financing to do that, I would totally do that. Cause I've got a number of people, like I could call up, I, I would create a writer's room. I could, there's 20 people I could call up today writers that I know that I would hire on and be like, Hey man, we're going to make, we're going to make six sci-fi and horror films this year, all for $5 million or less come up with pitches for me, you know, and, and, and they would, and then we'd put a, put together a team and go make the films. The thing was what full moon had was an output deal. So they knew that they were putting these movies out on video and they knew they were making a certain return on the films nowadays without, without, any kind of distribution or without a Netflix, you never know if that wouldn't, that wouldn't be financially viable unless you had a distributor. So part of the, part of what I would want to do is, is have a distributor, but then to get that, you'd have to already have made movies. So the distributor would know that you would do a good job. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. That, that's, that's very interesting. Cause like James Cameron, that's kind of how he started with like the Piranha film. I think he yeah. kind of directed that. And uh, like the, the the asylum, they do those very small budget films, yep. and they always make profit. So, yeah, that's that's awesome that you're thinking yeah, about. They, that. they they do those things too. The difference with Full Moon was we actually had a big facility where okay. we had a facility on where we were at. Like the asylum has these great offices, but they didn't have like a production facility. But Full Moon did. They had this giant warehouse facility with multiple buildings uh, off San Fernando Road in at the edge of Glendale. And it was it was a just an incredible place to be, really amazing. Yeah, so it's kind of like it's kind of like a version of Free Enterprise. Like they're very similar to what Full Moon and Full Eclipse was. Oh yeah, I, I mean, okay, yeah. There's the, the sound stages. I mean, absolutely. In the okay. longer version, of my preferred cut of Free Enterprise, you you meet my boss. Okay. Uh, raw, uh, you you see him in the movie, the version that you saw, but there's another scene where he comes back and fires the Robert character. And, um, I, I was never fired from full moon, but it, it, it you see more of how the studio worked and, yeah. uh, it, it was great. I mean, it was, again, the early nineties were so much fun. It was so much fun to be in LA in the early nineties. And, you know, you're, 
you're young and trying to, you're always scrapping, looking for jobs and things like that. But it was, it was great. It was so much fun. Uh, do you hate tomatoes, Rob? Because that's one thing that Rob hated tomatoes in the film. I was just wondering. I, I like tomato sauce. Okay. I, but tomatoes themselves, I'm not a fan of. <laughs> okay. Just making sure. And, and one last thing. Was Evian like a sponsor of the film? Because Evian like water bottles, they're like all throughout the film. The It was funny. We had different. Because the character of Mark in, in real life, the character of Mark is always was always ordering different water. Okay. You know, he always wanted non sparkling water. So yeah, when we when you make a low budget indie movie, um, and you want to put a product, it's called product placement. Yeah. Like we went to various companies and said, "Can you donate us water? We want to show your product in the film." So if they said yes, what what they do is they send you like a pallet of hundreds of bottles of their product and you you use it on camera so that okay. was always fun that was always yeah, just, fun. yeah just wondering I, those are some a few things i picked out i was wondering how true they were to your oh, counterparts yeah. of mark and rob but yeah there's most most of the things were true <laughs> or, or based in fact somehow uh, uh while a comedy, the film's a comedy, uh, what di the difficulties of being an editor in LA, it's not really mm. glossed over. Uh, you really hit on that in the film. Uh, are those instances, are, are the, is that kind of reflective of, of your experience in LA, uh, in, like in your 20s, like the character of Rob? Yes. Sure. I mean, it was, so when you're working in low budget film, and even now yeah. I'm still doing the same thing, you know, 30 years later, there's never as much money as you want. And nowadays, I feel that editing especially has been very devalued because back then, not everybody had the kind of equipment you need to edit a film. Um, nowadays, everybody has editing equipment. <laughs> you know, So people think, well, why should I pay for this equipment? Like before, you'd have to rent an edit bay and you're paying for the equipment and the room that you're editing in. But nowadays, like again, when I was working on Tango Shalom, I edited the film here. Like I, I've been in different places, this the, the Rob Observatory, my garage, where I've wound up. Um, but I've I've had many different places that I was editing in, and you're always using your own equipment, and people just it, the editor has been devalued, especially at the independent level, because nobody has the money. You know, if you're making an independent movie for less than a million dollars, say, there's not a lot. I mean, the thing about editing is it's very labor intensive. Um, and people don't want to pay like if you're if your rate is say well you know i get five hundred dollars a day or a thousand dollars a day or something which is a lot but people are like oh i can't pay you five hundred dollars a day because we might we might not be done in 10 weeks and i'm like no one's ever done in 10 weeks on an independent movie most of the independent movies i've edited took a year to cut well nobody has that kind of money so you know they don't they run out you know <laughs> they don't it's so it's 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 always hard to to uh, get paid at, at that level. I mean, it's, yeah. it's never, and nowadays people get paid a lot less. Like I get paid as an editor a lot less than I used to get paid, but, but that depends. Like that's, I'm talking about it at the, um, at the indie level, you know, not at the, um, um, uh, my girlfriend, hang on. She's, she's wondering why. No problem. Uh, let me just tell her I'm on a podcast. Uh, good. hang on. Uh, yeah, yeah. Free Enterprise is just it, it was it's just, just a really fun film, and I I was kind of thrown off by the romantic uh, side of it because I, from what I always was known about it, like what I always heard about it was like it was kind of a parody film, but it's it's not really that at all. No. I, it's no, that's what I that's what I was told, and that's what I expected. But I, I enjoyed what I saw, and like because I saw it over the summer, and I rewatched it yesterday. And it's it's a fun film. It, it reminds me kind of Clerks with uh, a love for Star Trek in a way. Yeah, I mean I we think. we patterned it on two movies. Really, it was yeah. it was it was Kevin Smith, and it was the movie Swingers. Okay, the, that Doug Lyman directed, that John Favreau wrote, and um, Vince Vaughn and John Favreau star in it. Um, so that was kind of how we patterned it. Once we knew that we could get away with. We're like, man, what if we did a movie like swingers, but with William Shatner in it. <laughs> and so that was, that was where it all, that was where it all came from. Yeah. And yeah, 
and getting more into what our conversation is meant to be about, but you're just such an interesting guy, Rob, that oh. it's hard to get onto that. <laughs> but just adaptations and ad, uh, adaptating like IPs from previous and just history. Uh, like one thing that you're very dedicated and passionate about is Star Trek and Star Wars. And those mm. are two IPs that have been like, in my mind, an adaptation is you can adaptate like the pr original Star Wars and the Mandalorian is kind of like an adaptation of what the original Star Wars was for like a new audience and a new age. And same thing for Discovery and Picard, just like you've been discussing on your own channels. But, but yeah, we've seen them in two forms. And one, I think we can both say is more successful and more well loved by the original audience than the other. Right. And what would you, what can you say is the reason for that? Like, why would you say that the Mandalorian is more well loved by the original audience than probably discovery and, and or Picard? Well, I think, I think first, you know, we have these IPs that have been around for a long time. Whether it's Star Trek and Star Wars, Star Trek is over 50 years old, Star Wars is 43 years old now, Doctor Who is 50 years old. Uh, there's there's a lot of these, these IPs that have been around for a long time that have a very uh, passionate fan base. And I think if you're going to attach yourself or you're going to attack making or working in, within that IP, I think it's really important to try and understand why that IP was successful in the first place. And again, what I always say, uh, it, it's always your characters and your story. You know, you have to begin with your characters and your story. And the thing with the IPs like Star, Star Wars and Star Trek, they really came out of the mind of one man, which was George Lucas in the case of Star Wars and Gene Roddenberry in the case of Star Trek. Now, that's not to say that once these ideas spring forth, that that person doesn't suddenly get a lot of collaborators because you need a lot of people that are bringing these things to the screen and what has happened with our ips is now that these like star trek and star wars that have been around for a long time have proven to be very lucrative in the long run uh they attract the attention of corporations and so they're bought like star wars being bought by disney the problem with that is that suddenly star wars which was the product of really one man's imagination now is overseen by an entity that's interested in how can we exploit this property to make the most amount of money possible for our studio. Well, the last thing they want to do is have it have its own individuality, really. They want like, okay, a Star Wars movie must be the engine that drives our theme parks and our we have to make clothing and 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 collectibles and and whatever video games i mean the the suddenly these ips become the engine by which these corporations are making all kinds of different products and attractions and things so by definition they want these ips to appeal to the most amount of people possible now they're not thinking well we have to have a great story and great characters they're thinking what elements can we now we'll take our ip say star wars and we know it's successful so how do we make a Star Wars that appeals to the most amount of people so we can then exploit this property across all of our platforms, video games, movies, theme parks, or whatever? The problem with that is what made those IPs unique in the first place, which was usually the vision of one person, is, is that's the first thing that goes when these IPs are now in control of the studio. And it's problematic because... How do you, as a studio that's invested, say, $4 billion in Star Wars, are you going to entrust that investment to one person? What if that one person's idea isn't good? So you've got these two forces that are in, in opposition, which is, yeah. one, an IP that is creatively um, led by one person. And then you have a corporation that needs to exploit this IP across many different platforms and the problem is is once the uh, once the ip is sold it's the many different platforms that take precedence over the ideas and for instance you look at the force awakens now the last time we saw luke skywalker princess leia and han solo and r2 and 3po and chewbacca and lando calrissian they had just defeated the empire 
well, they just just defeated the emperor, and and there were celebrations across the galaxy. Then, when we see them thirty years later, when they make the Force Awakens, the galaxy is almost in the exact same place it was before they won the Battle of the Death Star two over Endor. You have this new thing, the First Order, which is just Empire light, and then instead of Darth Vader, you've got Kylo Ren, you know, a, a Han Solo's son turned bad, and and so immediately what you've done is you've kind of dumbed down your IP because you want to make it like, we have to make it like the original Star Wars so we can appeal, we can appeal to a whole new fan base with all of these new, young, exciting characters that we've not met before, like Rey, who's basically a Luke Skywalker clone in a way, and then Kylo Ren, who's Vader, and then we've got um, Poe Dameron, who's like Han Solo, you know, and then amalgamations of these characters. But the first question any Star Wars fan will ask themselves, like an old school fan like myself, is like, well, how did these how did these people, how did my heroes, after winning the freedom of the galaxy, allow the First Order to arise again? Why did they allow Starkiller Base to get built? And so all of these things you ask yourself as an audience member, what? this doesn't make any sense. The, the galaxy is in exactly the same place it was when we just saw our three movies that are the most successful fantasy films ever made or whatever up until like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter. But And everything they did was for naught. Now the galaxy is right back to where. So immediately, because Disney wants to have people recognize, they don't care about aging fans like me. They want to get all these new fans, young fans, young people. But the problem is their versions of these characters even kids, even young people that were Star Wars fans, if you're eight years old and you see Star Wars, Empire, and Jedi, when you watch Force Awakens, you're going to be like, I don't like what they did to Han Solo. You know, they, they, he gets killed and run through by his own son and falls off a bridge. Like, how, how, that's, that, what? You know, so I think that we're, we're, we're having these growing pains. And then you have another problem is you have younger writers who, they want to inject their feelings about today, you know, and it's, and Star Trek is really suffering from it's being turned into something like to me, Star Wars or Star Trek, Star Trek has always been an action adventure science fiction show that is allegorical. It's, it's an allegory through the prism of science fiction, fantasy and horror or science fiction and action adventure. Uh, but it's allegorical to us today. So when the crew of the Enterprise would encounter an alien civilization, it would be the alien civilization that would have the commentary about our world today. Um, the crew was this futuristic crew. They all got along. They were from a utopian Earth, and they had to be that way. So when they encountered these outside forces, the outside forces would be the stand-in for us. Like We would recognize ourselves in whatever problematic alien civilization that they would run across but the characters kirk spock and mccoy were absolutely iconic and heroic and they were archetypes they were archetypical characters well nowadays they kind of do the exact opposite all of the characters if you watch star trek discovery they're all like this week's episode that dropped uh, they're all whiny and problematic this, this episode even opens up with a, a voiceover with Culber's character talking about how everybody's basically suffering from a version of PTSD because they're far from home and they've gone into the future and oh, woe is me. And they've tried to make Star Trek into something that's more along the lines of having, you know, they want rep people's representation. Uh, they want they want everybody to recognize themselves. So they've basically turned the crew, instead of the crew being these archetypes of the very best of humanity, the crew is now us. So we're now seeing people that crew the starship that are, are that they're petty and they have problems and they've they've got emotional issues and all of that. And, and they think that that's still Star Trek. But in my mind, they fundamentally compromised the thing about Star Trek that you need, which is you have to have characters like I've always thought that the characters in your favorite movies are like your friends and they're people you either want to be like or hang out with, or no. And like when you watch your favorite movies over and over and over again, say you're a Lord of the Rings fan, or a Harry Potter fan, or a Hunger Games fan, like if you love the Hunger Games, you love Katniss Everdeen. And the reason you watch those movies over and over again is because she, she's cool, she kicks ass, you want to grow up and be like her. 
you know, and and I think what's really interesting with these modern uh, franchises that are old is that the the modern versions of them is that you you don't want to be like I don't want to be I don't want to hang out on the Star Trek Discovery, I mean on the Starship Discovery. I don't want to all those people. I don't like them. You know, they're not those archetypical heroic characters that I can be invested in. And and I think another problem with a lot of modern IPs that have been around for a long time is they used to set trends. They used to be original. Now all the people that are working on these are now pulling stuff out of everything they've seen over the last 50 years and are putting them in to these franchises. Like Discovery, especially the season, seems like a mishmash of about 10 different things. So yeah. it's, it's, it's really difficult. Now, on the other hand, if you look at an IP that's been incredibly well managed, look no further than the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, where where Kev, a guy like Kevin Feige, as a producer, he worked on 13 Marvel movies before working on Iron Man, before the MCU. He saw movies like Ghost Rider, Elektra, Daredevil, the X-Men films, Sam Raimi, Spider-Man movies. He saw what worked and he saw what didn't work. And I mean, he's a pretty smart guy. He came up the same way I did, sort of, in that he was a, a, a PA. I believe he was a PA with with Jeff Johns at Richard Donner's office on the Warner Brothers lot, right around the corner from where my office was. Um, and the what he's done is he has an innate understanding of what makes what are what are, what are Marvel movies? Well, Marvel movies are derived out of Marvel comics. So if we're ever if we ever want to know what direction that we should take, let's look at the classic Marvel comic books and let's emulate that because that's what built the brand in the first place. So the idea of having guest stars in comics, like in this issue of Captain America, Tony Stark shows up to fight whomever. And so that always worked, you know, and, and they have big team up, big event style. The infinity gauntlet, for instance, was a big event comic in the, in the, in the, in the Marvel universe in the comics. So Kevin Feige has a real bead on, he knows exactly what he's supposed to do with his franchise. And then as a visionary producer, look at who he cast in those roles. He cast both known actors and unknown actors. And then he went after not your A-list directors that would typically be gone after, but he would find like, wow, I like the Russo brothers TV work. I bet I can pluck them out of television. I bet I can put them to work on a movie and get something great. And what does he get? He gets Winter Soldier, Captain America, the Winter Soldier by getting the Russo brothers. And then he wants to do Guardians of the Galaxy. So what do I do? I go find James Gunn, a man who who I've actually worked with, but a man who uh, had only directed movies up to $3 million. And then he does Guardians of the Galaxy. So Kevin knows that the infrastructure that they've built to make those movies works synergistically with the visionary filmmakers that he finds, but the filmmakers know and understand they're working within a paradigm. They're working within the strict desires of what the studio wants. And so when they do things like you have Taika Waititi doing Ragnarok, Thor Ragnarok, and now Thor Love and Thunder, the Russo brothers doing Captain America, Winter Soldier, then Civil War, and then they go over and do in Infinity War and... Um, Endgame, there's there's a lot of success there because Kevin Feige and uh, uh, Luis Desposito and Vic Victoria, um, oh God, what's her last name? Alonzo? Is it Victoria Alonzo? Uh, they, right, yeah. they know what they're doing. You know, they understand and they're the ones, they're, they might not be George Lucas, but there's there's they have a singular, even though there's three of them, they have a singular vision and they know what's up. They don't, they don't have to take marching orders from a corporate entity like Disney because they're already successful. You know, they were successful. Iron Man was a Paramount movie. And, you know, they brought, they brought, uh, Marvel was bought by Disney, which was really shrewd. So I think the key to great IPs is to understand the essence of that IP and understand why it's been successful to even become a viable IP that people want to buy or people want to continue. And I think one of the problems, the problem that I have, especially with Star Trek, is they've tried to turn something into something else. J.J. Abrams in 2009 said he was not a big Star Trek fan. He never was. Growing up, if you watch, he was on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Watch this clip when J.J. Abrams is talking about Star Trek, and he says, I never liked Star Trek. And yet they give him Star Trek. So what does J.J. Abrams do? He immediately starts trying to turn Star Trek into more 
more like Star Wars. And the 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 I think the IP has been suffering. The Star Trek IP has suffered ever since. But yeah, yeah, like like you said, uh, it comes down to the leadership kind of because uh, JJ he did both uh, original uh, sequel trilogies, two thousand nine Star Trek, and The Force Awakens. And yeah, yeah when we look at uh, Kevin Feige, uh, his his works and adaptions of the comics are seen in a better light, I would say, by the original uh fans so oh, yeah yeah so it, it comes down to those creatives in charge but yeah like I, it's just i don't really understand why they would give him star trek if you're not a fan it just seems like such a fan driven uh ip but well there's also uh, another problem is you have to understand that hollywood is very risk averse and so jj abrams has had a very successful television run for quite a long time lost so yeah. yeah he's lost and he's done like i think he did felicity, felicity yeah he, there's so many things that jj abrams has done so he's proven himself a known commodity and people really like him so when they hired him to do star trek star trek was sort of moribund it was sort of dead after enterprise yeah. and they wanted to reboot it and they had this take they paramount or cbs knew what they wanted to do and jj abrams decided you know, okay, we want to get involved because he saw a franchise that could be exploited. Let's do movies and television shows and video games and all that. But, and he didn't want his company, Bad Robot, didn't want any of the old Star Trek still promoted. And that caused a big problem with the studio. Like, what do you mean? We still make a lot of money on all of our old Star Trek product. And they're like, Bad Robot's like, no, we don't want you to sell that anymore. We only want you to sell new stuff. Well, the problem is the new Star Trek stuff, nobody. I mean, maybe some people do, but nobody is clamoring for even the action figures that they made for Star Trek 09 didn't sell well because, you know, Kirk, Spock and McCoy are, are they're not Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto and Carl Urban. They're DeForest Kelly and Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner. They have been for half a century. So it's hard to get over that. It's hard to reinvent, um, you know, your IP. So, yeah, it's hard to do. Yeah. And like we see with the Mandalorian, it seems like uh, 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 John Favreau, he's a huge fan of the original yeah, series. Yeah. And that's and, why and, we're seeing And Dave success, Filoni, probably. too. Yeah. You know, this Mandalorian is a got student of George Lucas. A student of George Lucas. And so you've got two guys that basically, it's pretty much their show. And it's interesting because Disney, sure, Disney and Kathleen Kennedy and, and uh, Lucasfilm and Disney oversee the Mandalorian. But what you're getting is you're getting a take that comes out of two two creatives that were sort of they they knew what they wanted to do they had a they had a vision for it and they've gone out and executed on that vision and uh they created a star wars that you know when you watch the mandalorian whether you love the mandalorian or not it's undeniable that the mandalorian is full of love of star wars and they've it's not there's all new characters there but it's all very familiar feeling like you feel like, yeah, it doesn't hurt that the Mandalorian is a Mandalorian and he looks like Boba Fett, but the, the, the stories feel very much in the star Wars universe. And whereas I think that the, the, the JJ Abrams, the sequel, the Disney sequel trilogy was all over the map and it, it didn't give you, it didn't give you the kind of star Wars buzz. It should have. Whereas the Mandalorian does from the outset, but with with the the Force Awakens and and Last Jedi and the Rise of Skywalker, it's it's just all over the place. You don't you don't really feel like they should have. I don't understand why they should have planned all three movies together. They kind of did, and that was sort of derailed. But like when I reported on the Duel of the Fates script, when I was got that script, you know, I read this script. And I'm like, this is just a way better. This feels like a Star Wars. It's movie. great, yeah. You know, it, it was a great. I found it online finally, like yeah. after, and I guess it came out a, a long time ago. But I, I loved when you reported on that, and I, I was just fantasizing about what this could have been because I know it, it, it seems awesome. It and it does the characters, the original, the new characters that they made for the sequel trilogy, so much more justice. Oh. And and I, I understand what happened with Carrie Fisher. You would have to change a lot, but. Just, just what it could have been is very disappointing. <laughs> it is, and and what's funny is that they they had it, you know they yeah. it was that script was written. Colin Trevorrow wrote that script. They were ready to go, and they changed things around. And when I look at when I look at 
rise of skywalker it's just like it's a mess it doesn't it, it again it's it whereas the the duel of the fate script it was like wow this feels really interesting yeah and as someone it, who wanted to love it so bad like uh the rise of skywalker it, it's 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 hard but i i can't wait to read because i as i was doing research for this interview i i found the actual script online and i can't wait to read that and i'm sure you have already and you 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 seem to have loved it so i, I read your notes on it so yeah uh, i can't wait <laughs> Yeah, I really, yeah, I, awesome. I loved it. I thought it was great. It just felt like a Star Wars movie, you know. Yeah. And and Colin Trevorrow is a Star Wars fan. I think he's actually a pretty great writer too. So, you know, it worked. It worked out. With Derek Connolly. I I love Derek Connolly's work. Like, yeah. The, their first film, I forget the name of it, but Safety uh, Not Guaranteed. Yeah, I I love that. It's it's such a weird little film, but yeah, it, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it is. And again. Again, you know, they were the, they, that was an original film. That and and the thing about J.J. Abrams is he's only ever worked on on. I mean, Super Eight was kind of original, but it was a slavish homage to Steven Spielberg. And yeah. I think one of the problems that I have with like J.J. Abrams is he doesn't really have his own voice. You know, he did Mission Impossible, then he did the Star Trek movies, and he's trying to emulate other things like Star Trek as Star Wars and then Star Wars as Star Wars. Like he needed, he needed to bring his own voice to it. And I don't think that he has his own voice as a filmmaker yet. And yeah, that's why it think, seems like he's a king of reboots or right. Just, right. Yeah. So yeah, I can, I'm looking forward to what he can do. Like, I guess he has lost and other stuff like that, but I mean, just to find his own voice, like you're saying, because uh, yeah he's he's in a, the favor of a lot of studios like you said before so yeah he has the opportunities like he's with warden brothers right now so hopefully he can make use of that yeah i mean they they brought him they gave him a half billion dollar deal you know and and it would be interesting to see him tackle something like that isn't a previously existing property there's talk of him doing another superman movie you know and and i i i don't know i mean i don't know how great that would be so yeah <laughs> yeah hopefully uh we can see his voice sooner or later but uh on on adaptions as well like oh uh, we've seen recently a lot of video game adaptions failing mm. and it, uh, people are saying like like in my, at least in my uh philosophy about this is just the disconnect between like choice because a lot of these uh, original fans when you play a game you have choice usually you can do some things you can uh you can choose to make certain actions other than uh an, another one but with a film you're on a you're on rails and you have to make those choices for the viewer so i, I think that might be some of the reason why like video games in a particular aren't in the best state that they should be because properties like warcraft and assassin's creed they're very rich like in uh, like talk about verisimilitude those original properties I, I i think they have a lot of it they do so yeah it, it, it's disappointing to me because i'm a personal fan of like the assassin's creed just the uh, video games i love history and hopefully they can try to i don't know i it's it's a difficult uh road to walk on because they it, you have they haven't seen much success yet so what do you think about that rob well, I think, okay, first of all, a, a video game storyline is built so the player, it'll pull, the, the story pulls the player along to go from game sequence to game sequence. And there are a lot of games like The Last of Us being one of them that tell very emotional stories that people get caught up in. The first time, when I played the first Uncharted, it was the first time, and what was that, like 15 years ago or something? Um maybe not 10 years ago when I first played uncharted, it was the first time where I was playing. And I'm like, I, the cut scenes and the character work and everything. I'm like, I was totally in, into it. I'm like, wow, this is a, this is a story. Like I'm, I'm completely immersed. And I think like, like with assassin's creed or something, the milieu is given to you. Enzo or what, what, what was is Enzo? The first Ezio, 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 Ezio yeah. yeah. It's an Ezio from the first. Version. Yeah. He's from the first two. Yeah, so you got Ezio, who's the first character. You understand what the game is. You understand the milieu. You're given the characters. You're given all of those things. And to me, it's like, okay, you know what the period is. You know what 
the character is supposed to be. Now, then what they need to do is then they need to find a... You don't have to look necessarily to the video game for the story, but you could find something within the period. Like, to me, have you ever seen a movie... It's directed by Christoph Gans called Brotherhood of the Wolf. No. It, it's a it's a period action film that also deals with there may be a werewolf out there, but but you're dealing with the period, and yet you've got Mark DeCostas is in it. There's martial arts and fighting, and there's all kinds of stuff. It's a, definitely a genre pastiche of things. But to me, like if you wanted to do a great Assassin's Creed movie, you've got the game. You know what it looks like. You know what the milieu you know where it's supposed to take place. Well, then what you have to do is you've got to go look elsewhere and find a great story. Like, what is the story? Is there is there a historical event, or is there like, for instance, when they made um when when they made uh the Man with No Name movies, the the Clint Eastwood movies, uh, f uh, f uh fistful of dollars fistful for of a few dollars, dollars yeah. more, and and Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, a fistful of dollars is based on a Japanese movie. You know, it's really? Jimbo. Yeah, your Jimbo and Sanjuro. Oh. These, these, these uh, uh, Akira Kurosawa films, and they're like, oh, we can take these samurai movies and transpose them into this Western setting and follow the storyline. So, what an uh, to me, if I was going to make an Assassin's Creed film, I'd be like, okay, I got the video game. I know what everybody looks like. I know the world it's set in. Now, what story? That has nothing to do with the the Assassin's Creed video game because I've already got the characters and everything, but now I can go tell any story. Go find like go find a Kurosawa movie to adapt. Like what story can I find that I can transpose into the universe or the world of Assassin's Creed? And how does my main character work uh, within that story? You know, for instance, they would do that like Die Hard Two was actually a script that had nothing to do with Die Hard called 58 Minutes. And and they adapted it. And, and look, I'm not a huge fan of Die Hard 2 because I think it's goofy and it's not as well-directed as the first. But they needed a Die Hard story. And rather than try and come up with some John McClane story from scratch, that they, they found another script that they already liked. And they're like, oh, this script works. Let's turn this into a, into a Die Hard movie. And in the case of like Assassin's Creed, they can find a story that comes from somewhere else. You know, whether it's another movie, like a Kurosawa film or some historical epic or whatever, and put it into the Assassin's Creed universe because you know what the character is supposed to be doing. What you need is a story to tell, a story that's really compelling. I'll give you an example right now. I can't tell you what it is, but I have been working on an animated series for Netflix small role i'm just editing the animatics and the animatics are the story reels that the, it's before the animation is done i'm just helping the showrunners when they're at the point where they're about to go to animation i come in and i do a final pass and then that's sent well this video this this animated series is based on a game it's based on a video game i can't tell you what it is but it's it's a very well known video game around the world but it doesn't have a story it's more like a melee game like a Fortnite kind of a thing and it there isn't it's got elements that everybody knows what the elements are but it doesn't have a storyline per se so my friend who created the series he took the basic elements of that that are in this game and created this enormously complex like game of thrones level complex world now he uses everything that you hear in the game but the game is sort of like i said it's like a melee game so there's no storyline so he created all of this 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 hugely elaborate storyline that goes along with this with this game now i'm going to be i'm i think it's great i mean the story is really really compelling it's 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 very very interesting it's this is going to drop in in march i think awesome. um and it hasn't even been announced. That's why. I can, otherwise, I just I'm not yeah. trying to be cagey. You're like I know. I know yeah, you know. I understand. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't because it hasn't been announced by anybody yet. It's being made, but like Netflix, you know, they don't announce things till really they're done, and then they can drop all of the, the the issue the uh, episodes. And we've we we had a three season order, and uh, I just watched the I just did sound notes on the final episode of the first season, um, and it 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 um. It's really interesting to see what he's done with a video game property and and to see where it's gone. So it's 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 pretty incredible. 
but but again, he's not really adapting. He created something new using the inspiration from what the game is. But with Assassin's Creed, I think it's really important that you stay true to that character and his order and uh, and the world that he lives in. And you've got you've got to stay true to that that thing because that's your. But but that that's all an audience is going to ask of you. They want you to be true to Assassin's Creed, which I don't think the movie really was. I mean, it had kind of a goofy, convoluted plot, I thought. Um, yeah. And it, it didn't have the kind of kick-ass story that I think an Assassin's Creed game needed. Um, and I think that the, the secret to doing that is finding, again, you've got your character, now you have to find your story. It's not going to succeed just because it's Assassin's Creed. Now we have Uncharted being made, you know, Nathan Drake, and I'm, I'm Sully, and I'm really curious to see, like, okay... With Uncharted, we know it's it's an Indiana Jones esque franchise set in the, the modern day. You've got these treasure hunters that are penetrating the jungle somewhere, the someplace to go find something. I mean, the the it's it's a quest game, treasure hunting game. That's what Assassins. Uh, that's what Uncharted is. So you got to stick to that. So now you've got all the the trappings, the characters. What you really need is a great treasure hunting story. You don't have to necessarily look at the video games themselves. We know what they're supposed to be doing, but you got to now tell me a great story about a great, whatever it is they're going after and whoever is trying to stop them or steal whatever it is. Um, you got to make that great. You got to give that, you got to give us a great story. And if yeah. you do that, then it'll be, it'll be good. And you know, the actors are saying the script is really good. So hopefully it will be. And to me, you know, the you've got the Tomb Raider movies, but it's still you go back to the first Raiders of the Lost Ark, and that's like your template. You know, you've you're you're yeah. hunting for a treasure that and the in the end, the treasure proves that the the power of God resides in it, and, and uh it, it it goes from being a great adventure film to ending on an epic note where the Almighty himself may have stepped in to vanquish the Nazis. And so when you leave Raiders of the Lost Ark, you're like, Man, that was kick ass. I love that. So yeah. Yeah, and just like you said, with uh, 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 the uh, Uncharted films, uh, they're the, the games themselves are made to kind of be like films in a way. Yeah. They're very cinematic games, so I think they lend themselves to films like more than any other may, maybe game previously, just for that reason alone. Because I, I they agree. Take a lot of elements. That's why when I first played that first Uncharted, I'm like, this is like, this is the first time I felt like playing a video game was playing a movie because I was that yeah. invested in the characters and the, in the cut scenes. Yeah. So I, yeah, that one has a lot of expectations for myself at least. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to it. And it, it's, I don't know if it's supposed to take place in the same universe as the games, but it's a younger Nathan Drake. So, right. Who knows? So I, always uh, saw, I, I, I always saw Nathan Drake as being as, in his mid 30s. Yeah. You know, like like or late twenties, mid thirties, like an in Indiana Jones, and I love love Tom Holland, but he's again just he's as a person, he's a little slight, he's a little diminutive, he's he's not a tall, strapping, muscle bound dude, and yeah, that's that, slender that, Peter Parker, yeah, yeah, he's a slender Peter Parker, and I always saw Nathan Drake as being a little bit more rough and tumble, yeah, you know, and and uh, a little bit more of a manly man, but that's just me. I mean, I saw him in that, that one shot they had of him in the full costume. I mean, he looked just like Nathan Drake to me. I mean, they nailed what he's supposed to look like, but I just, his face alone, his, he's, he's so young looking. Some people are young, but they can, they look a little bit more rugged. He looks, doesn't look like he's going to penetrate, you know, an ancient temple <laughs> he's a baby and, face. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a baby face and there's no, and I understand that they, they wrong with that, but no, they cast the movie based on, okay, his box office success is 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 what it is. You look at the movies he's been in, he's made a lot of money because he's been in Marvel movies as Spider-Man and he's been in other movies as well. And and I think it's it's for a studio they want for a movie this big, they have to have a, a, a box office draw to play the lead. They can't be like, we're gonna get an exciting newcomer to be in the uncharted movie. That would have been great if they're spending fifty million dollars on it, but they're probably spending between 150 and 200 million. So they need somebody in the lead that they can bank on yeah it's sony's golden child right now and that's tom holland so they're gonna use them uh are you a gamer rob are you still because you said you play the uncharted games yeah I, you know I, what? I never knew that you played 
my my i haven't played uh, i'll i will i would get the last game that i played that i was obsessed by and i played it for years was grand theft auto 5 really uh the lot because i i loved it now i was like i don't need to play any other video games i used to be much more of a gamer than i am now but the only reason is is that i just haven't had any time yeah but there's stuff coming out like i just you know i watched that new there's a new trailer out for devil may cry 5 and I'm like, well, that game came uh, out a while ago. Then, but the new one for the for the um, PlayStation Five oh, remastered. Okay, yeah. yeah the, I, okay. I, I I looked at it. And I'm like, because I loved the Capcom. I loved the Onimusha series, and I loved Devil May Cry. And, I'm not familiar you know, with Onimusha, and I, I I love just the games, the game industry. But oh yeah, well Onimusha yeah. is a game. It's it's a Japanese samurai. A, a, a horror Japanese samurai game where he's, okay. he's it's very it's very similar to Devil May Cry. It's a okay. it, it's in the same neighborhood, but I I love those Capcom games and I love like you know I love Devil May Cry as far as action games go. But and I loved Uncharted and I love like I love Battlefront two, the Star Wars. I, I love Star Wars video games if, if oh, they're yeah. good. There's been a lot of bad ones, but and then I love um uh. Uh, like I said, Grand Theft Auto, but give me, give me games like that. I really, I really want to play Cyberpunk. Uh, I can't 20, wait. I, I can't. I, I, I pre-ordered three years ago. Like, I, yeah. I, I mean, that's the kind of thing. That's the kind of thing. I look at that game. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I love open world sandbox games. I, I, I love stuff like that. It's just, you know, you get obsessed. Like when I get involved, I can't stop playing it and it, it completely yeah. takes over my life and it's be, it's when i was making free enterprise the company that i was working with um they were working on a sound a surround sound for video games system and the first game that they had done it on was uh uh activision's remake of the 80s uh classic um battle zone and and battle zone was a it was a combination first person shooter and then it was an rpg our uh, RPG and a real time strategy game roll, rolled into one, so I was obsessed. And and it, it, the the physics basically it was about the Cold War still being fought on planets in the solar system, like on the Moon, on Venus, on Mars, on Uranus. And you you have a you have to build your base and and get all these natural resources. And at the same time, you're in a tank and you have to take out the Soviets. Or if you want to play as the Soviets, you have to take out us. And I was obsessed. Like I couldn't, I couldn't, I'd work, I'd edit the movie for a couple hours and I'd have to get up and play this video game some more. I mean, it was, I was completely obsessed by this game. And because it was so the the real time strategy element of it was so great. But then you're you're in a tank, so you're it was a first person, and you could even eject from the tank. So you could be a, a, your a, in your astronaut self and you could you could sit up on a rock. You could climb up on a rock outcropping and wait till one of the enemy tanks came by. And you could use your rifle, your sniper rifle, and take out the driver and then go into their tank and take it back to the enemy encampment. It was just that game. That game was so. For anyone who's ever played that that remake, Activision's Battle Zone game, it was it was the shit, man. That's that the game. That sounds insane for ninety eight. Like, oh. I have to check that out. Yeah. Oh, it was amazing. I like I'd love to get I've looked up, you know, emulators and stuff and yeah. I'm just like, eh. But, you know, I was a child of the <coughs> of the 80s, so I grew up playing. I mean, my favorite video game console game of all time is Defender and Stargate. I mean, those are my two. And then there was another game called Scramble I loved and Star Castle. But I, you know, I love those games and and then as they got more sophisticated, things like Spy Hunter and I had Spy Hunter for PlayStation 2. And, you know, it's it just, but as you get older and you have so much work to do, I mean, now between the shows I'm working on and the movie, I got to get out to festivals and the YouTube shows and everything, it's really hard. Cause when I like, to, I like to sit down and play a game for like six or seven hour, hours at a time. Yeah. Cause that lets you get like Grand Theft Auto. And then when Grand Theft Auto, I'd finished the game and then they had the online component and they kept adding to it. They're, Rockstar's still making money off Grand Theft Auto. 5. Oh, it's a it's a money it's a money bank. It's a that's why they won't stop. It's that's what, it's all online stuff. They buy credit cards in game. It, I know it's insane. It's insane. I just want I want Grand Theft Auto Six. Oh you know? yeah, they're working on that, but who knows when that's going to come yeah, out? Take years. <laughs> I mean, I still want to play Star Citizen. 
Star- oh, that- Rob, that's never coming. <laughs> you did you you don't tell me that you like gave the money. No, no. Okay, thank you. People but did. Somebody, people gave somebody, thousands of dollars. So. Oh, I know. I, yeah, people never gave, they've sent me like um like a demo, like a beta test thing that but I'm I but I that that kind of game appeals to me or, or there's a, a game uh, No Man's Sky. Did you ever play yeah, that? Yeah. Uh, I never played it but I know a lot about it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a, I I I love games like that. Let me fly infinitely through the universe and get my own planet and you know, it's just I love yeah. stuff like that. I could and then you know, I've never got into the Star Trek uh, online, even though I've wanted to. You know, I just, I'm like, I can't. I can't. Yeah, yeah. I would. I, I, would, um, I think much. my dad might have played it for a little bit because he's he's a huge Star Trek fan. That's how I, that's how I'm familiar with the IP. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. He loves Generations, the original series, Deep Space Nine, all of them. So, yeah, that's how I got to know them. But yeah. if yeah and then but yeah. it, it, it's just you know the uh, spider-man playstation 4 spider-man you know oh, stuff i'm an xbox guy so i can't i can never play that but it oh. looks awesome yeah i mean those <laughs> I, I i was a, i grew up a playstation dude you know okay. i had an xbox for a while though i still have a there was a there was a star trek xbox game called star trek shattered universe i think that was kind of fun. yeah it was kind of fun to play yeah um, but if I'm you can ever to... balance your time robert oh right there Maybe. Um, yeah. No. These are PlayStation no. three. Those are PlayStation three games. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how old school I am. Um. But yeah. Well, yeah. But if you can ever balance your time and like if for Cyberpunk, try to do like a little Let's Play series, like show your gameplay. Like if you ever play that, like oh, yeah. I'd watch that. No, that would be awesome. Man, but, I you I, know I yeah. I, I, I yeah I'll get on. T- do You're Twitch a busy guy. Me. Yeah. So I mean, I, I would love to do that. You know, I'd love oh, yeah, to go that'd back. be cool to watch. I'd love to go back and play, like go even do old school games. Like, there's a. Have you ever played a place? I'm looking at back there. This PlayStation Two game, either Ico or uh, Shadow of Colossus. Yeah, I'm ever, familiar. Yeah, yeah the those, Japanese games. Yeah, I love those games. And like, when I, I would have loved to have like been on Twitch when Ico first came out. As I'm trying to figure out, because Ico is basically. You're going through this castle. It's like a puzzle game. You're going through this castle trying to rescue this princess before these spirits get her. And and basically, you're in these rooms, and you have to figure out, well, how do I get out of this room? Like that's. And then when you get out of it, you're in another room, and you have to figure out how do you get out? What are you going to do? I mean, if somebody, if I had Twitch, if Twitch existed back when Ico came out, I would have watched people play Ico uh, for <laughs> hours just to see, like, how are you going to get out of this room? You know, and it, it's, I, I, yeah, I, I, I one day I should get Twitch going and <laughs> yeah, play it, just try to balance your time because yeah, it, it, you could do it. I, I'd like to watch, but like I would love to, I would love to do that with Battlezone. Battle to, to, yeah. to do I'd the, like to watch the, the ninety-eight Battlezone, so. play that again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Maybe even know if you can because it, it was a PC game. I don't even know if PCs would run Battlezone anymore. You know, I, I've, people find a way. They 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 stream anything. So I know I, I, I know. wouldn't know how to do it, but I'm sure you have all your all your fans would help you out. Uh, <laughs> help me play. Help me play the '98 Battle Zone on a Mac. Help me do that. <laughs> anything's possible nowadays. But uh, we're we're about to close out. Maybe like 20 minutes left. Try to sell me on physical media, Rob, because uh, I, I I grew up. I'm a 2000 kid i grew up in the year 2000 i was born in 2000 uh i was vhs's were big in that time but i i just i have a lot of books in my room i don't have any physical media the only two dvds i have two vhs's in my room and they're the two crow movies that a high school teacher threw out in the trash so i just pulled them out what the, the day my last day of high school i just found them in the trash and i pulled them out but i would never buy a like physical media like that's just i don't see the purpose because streaming you could basically find anything on streaming nowadays so try to sell me on okay first of all let me ask you a question yeah how big how big is the tv you have how big i have a monitor right here it's uh, i think it's 40 inches now do you watch most of your movies on that monitor uh yeah yeah okay so you're watching on my xbox and i have my headset I just put my headset in and I just watch it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, for, for any fans of physical media, I think you have to have, like, I think one of the things that's essential is you have to have a great surround sound system. 
And when I say yeah. that, I'm talking a 7.1. So you have eight speakers. You've got your front uh, left and right, your middle center speaker. You've got your rear uh, left and right, maybe a center speaker. Um, and then you've got your uh, subwoofer. subwoofer. Yeah. Now, if you have a kick and surround sound system, and I, I mean, in a room that's set up, I mean, I think physical media, the, the benefits of physical media are, are readily apparent if you have a great surround sound system and even a pretty big projector uh, in, in your house. If you're, if you're just watching on a screen and, and streaming, I can understand why physical media would not be something that necessarily appeals to you. Cause why, why would you care? But if you have a bigger system and you really have a home theater system, um, physical media in terms of, of picture quality and sound quality is unparalleled. Streaming will eventually get there, but, but for the most part, um, it's, you, it's, it's something that really benefits you if you have bigger equipment and a bigger, if you, if you have a, a, a whole home theater system, that's really well calibrated. Now, the other advantage, and I'll, I'll give this to you as an example. Where did it go? Um, uh, here it is. Okay. So I got this this week. Now this is, it's a metal box. It's, this is all of the Rambo movies. All right. Now this in itself is like an object of art that you oh, can yeah. have. So this, and, and it's, this is metal. And then it has all of the Rambo movies uh, in 4K uh, in Steelbooks. So yeah, Steelbooks are beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So here's like here's the Steelbook for First Blood. You know, and now if you like the Rambo series, this is something. So even beyond the physical media, um, you know, this is collectible. You, you you have something like this, and if you're a fan of the Rambo movies, not only is this the best version of how to get those films, you've got all the movies here streaming, but if you've got a home theater system and a big screen, you've got the best versions of these movies that have ever existed. HDR, Dolby Vision, I mean, which but more and more streamers are adapting as well. But it, this is the kind of thing where if you like Rambo, and you have this on your shelf. I mean, there's an element of it, collectability. Like, okay, you've got it. It's it's yours. And I think that if you combine those two things, if you combine mostly, look for me, it's all about the experience of watching the movie. What brings you the best picture and sound? Period. That that and right now, physical media does that. There's and but again, you either have to you have to have a big screen and you have to have a big sound system to really love that. And I think most people nowadays, especially if, like you said, you're born in 2000, you grew up in a world where you've already got the screen that you're watching and playing your games on is infinitely better, for instance, than what I had when I was a kid. You know, I had an NTSC standard definition. It, it, it's garbage compared to, and for 50 years, we had garbage TVs and garbage, um, it, it, the worst compared, compared to what we have now. I mean, an HD TV set is six times better than what we used to get on TV. So your VHS tape, the screen you're watching, whatever you're watching on, if you're watching a streaming video at, at 4K, it's like, what is it, eight times or 12 times or 16 times better than a VHS image yeah, was? Insane. So, and when you've got decent headphones, and now most of the headphones people are buying are pretty great. If that's how you're watching movies, well, I can understand. You don't need, you don't, there's no need for you to change up what you're doing. But yeah. if you have, a, if you, and, and since you, you grew up in a world, you're not attached to physical media. Like for me, it's, it's like, ooh, because when I was a kid, home video was new so you couldn't get everything you wanted now there's this mentality i have a mentality like if something's coming out in 4k like if die hard is remastered or basic instinct with which were both shot by yon de bont not basic instinct and and die hard never looked good on home video it was always murky and fuzzy and and now if you get the 4k remaster of die hard it's a revelation it's like oh my god this movie has never looked the way it's supposed to look on home video, and now it does because of the way Jan DeBont, the cinematographer, shot it. He also shot Basic Instinct, which is another movie that's looked terrible on home video. And it's never looked good. So they've never recreated his photography. 
now I'm hoping with this 4K restoration, it's going to be, you know, where it needs to be. And and it's just, you know, there's another, again, I do, here, I'll, I'll show you something else that's pretty cool. Um, so my friend Dieter Bastian got this. I don't know if you know the British horror film Eden Lake. So this Not familiar, is no. Eden Lake. This disc is from Austria. This is the Austrian wow. version of Eden Lake. So this, they made it look like uh, an old VHS cover from the 80s. So you open up this disc, and this is just the best. <laughs> so here it comes like this, and you can't really see, but it, this is these are lenticular. So they're, they look three-dimensional. It's not wow. a tape. It's not a tape. Okay. You, op you open this up, and it's got it's it's got a booklet. Oops, it's got a booklet. Oops, oh, drop it. Hang on, and uh, and it's got uh, the movie, and and even wow. on the back. So so I just love the fact that, and this is kind of a grindhouse movie. And even the back, it looks. I mean, this looks like a beta. It's more beta than VHS or three quarter inch, but I just love this. And this is only available in Austria. And I just love the fact that this particular thing, it, it's like an object do art. You know, it's its its pretty cool. Do I need this in my life? Eh, probably not. But but I, I love having it. I mean, I love that. I love that somebody in Austria decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take Eden Lake and we're going to make it, we're going to give it a grindhouse vhs box style and and just because just because we can because it's cool and so you know i've got i probably have about 2500 uh blu-rays and i i think that blu-rays and 4k discs and i think i'm pretty much done like a lot of the stuff i buy are replacements like i've had the rambo movies now i take the old ones and either trade them in or sell them and now i've got the definitive because 4k is pretty much definitive that's where that's where physical media is going to end and I know that physical media probably has, I don't know, five years left. People are like, oh, it'll be niche like vinyl is. And I'm like, yeah, but vinyl is a lot cheaper to produce. You know, and I, I just think that we are we are at the end of physical media. And there'll always be people that collect. But at the end of the day, the real, the real thing about having physical media is to get copies of movies that aren't streaming. You know, your favorite movies that aren't available. But I, you know, I pretty much have everything that I would ever want. And, um, and also, again, I admit freely, it's also habitual. Like I've been, it's a habit to collect physical media. I've been doing it for like the better part of 40 years. And it's like, oh my God, if such and such is coming out on 4k, I have to get that, you know, if it's a great transfer. Yeah. Or, just by the dialogue and free enterprise, uh, you were like that in the nineties. Oh like, yeah. Yeah. Were those your toys in the. Uh, oh, collectibles no the, no, no okay they weren't i'll tell you why i'll tell you why because when we were making free enterprise we had to get everything that you saw in the movie all the toys everything was cleared so we had oh. to go all the movie posters all the clips and we went to lucasfilm and we said look can we have star wars toys in the movie and they said if it's if it's r-rated no oh. so we couldn't have star wars toys and i'm like what <laughs> and and the same was true of, of Paramount would not license Star Trek toys to us. Even William Shatner went to Paramount and said, "Can we get a license? Can we show some of these things in the um in the movie?" And they're like, "Nope." So we did sneak stuff in, but uh, so most of those toys were not mine. Okay, um, some yeah. of them were, but but yes, I my my toy collection is massive. Yeah, but, that's um, what. I, and while I watched, I was, I was just imagining if this was. This was like somewhat comparable to what you had in the nineties. So. Oh, oh no, I did. I I had a lot of stuff. It was a little different, but the yeah. problem is you have to get it all cleared. Like I have a lot of uh, diecast Japanese super robots, oh, okay. seventies animated shows. I would have loved to have put those in, but you'd have to. <laughs> it would take forever to get all that stuff cleared. I mean, it's weird that you have to do that, but you you do have to clear it. Like yeah. you can't you can't just show a Han Solo toy or something. You have to go to Lucasfilm and get it cleared, and maybe pay a fee, a licensing fee. So, yeah, it's kind of a uh, yeah, yeah, that's a bummer. Uh, was your uh, like home theater setup the same back then? Like kind of similar to what he had? Yeah, as a matter talk of about fact. antiquated <laughs> technology that, that you could kill someone with that one hundred percent, whatever. Because I think he said forty inch. Yeah, that uh, was that that was a 50 inch monitor and that that was actually mine. 
Okay. Know, that was my that was my mom. As a matter of fact, there's like even here, um, like this. This is the first uh, Japanese Star Wars letterboxed laser disc that was ever available in the world. And this is this is from a company. This came out, I want to say, eighty seven. This and this is in mint condition. But this is the first time Star Wars was ever released on home video. It's in, in its original aspect ratio, and it's like I don't even know if my player works. I don't think I've used my lasers player in twenty years. But I mean, I can't get rid of this. Yeah, that, that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, look at how cool that is. Special collection. You know, you open it up. I'll open it up since. Why not? We're live. I can do that. Um, and kids today, look, kids, here's a laser disc. So I've always wanted to see one. <laughs> uh, well, now, now you will. So, okay, this this is what's called a CAV laser disc, constant angular velocity, which means you can get thirty minutes per side, and uh, thirty minutes per side, and it um, it it every rotation of the disc is one frame so you can have a perfectly clear still frame so here is the disc itself wow and yeah it's pretty amazing now one of the problems with laser disc as a format is it's actually two pieces of plastic that's glued together and there's aluminum inside and basically like a cd there's a thousand maybe million millions of pits that the pits, the way they, that's where the information is when it's rotating. It's kind of like, uh, and, and what happens is when the glue separates, air would get into the, 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 um, the aluminum and it was, it would rust, it would oxidize. And so you would get what's called laser rot and the image, the material would start getting speckly and staticky and it was very sad, but that didn't usually happen with Japanese laser discs. So whenever that? Uh, they were just made differently. They were made they were made better. <laughs> 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 um uh like like when I was when I collected vinyl um American vinyl was terrible. Like like records. The 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 actual vinyl they used for the records was bad. And so what you'd want is I I would want to buy either UK British imports or if you could find them, the most coveted vinyl would be Japanese vinyl, because that's uh, that was the best. Okay. And and finding Japanese records, I mean, you're paying a premium. They're like twice as much as as uh, regular records if you could find them. So I, I was in college. I did some DJing and I bought a lot of twelve inch uh, remixes of things. And and you always wanted to get Japanese uh, vinyl if you could. So and Japanese laser discs were great too. It's just they had subtitles burned into the image. So there's nothing okay. you could you couldn't you couldn't turn the subtitles on and off. But like I was pretty fanatic like each one of my discs have these are like hard vinyl covers to collect, to keep the like you can see this looks brand new. Oh yeah. And uh, and um I was And that's from the 70s, right? Or the, the 80s. The 80s. Or... Yeah. Although laser okay. discs were introduced to the consumer uh consumers in 1978. Okay. And, uh, one of the initial test markets was Seattle, and I saw them when I was when I was growing up. Seattle and, and Houston, Texas, were the first markets. And you know, laser discs—they were always niche here. They they caught on much bigger in Japan. They were much bigger than they were here. But for a long time, they were the picture was way better than VHS. And I always said, oh, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll be buried with my laser discs." And that was until I saw my first DVD. You know, my friend, and then progressive scan DVD. I'm like, oh, so much for these laser discs. <laughs> bye bye. But I, but I kept, I kept, I probably have, I don't know, a hundred laser discs left just because they're worthless. I mean, I might as well throw them away. Like, what are you going to do with them? But I love the packaging. And, and one day I figured uh, I'll frame them all, or, or maybe I saw, I used to go to this store where they had a record store where they just hung CDs from the ceiling. They just spun around, and I'm like, oh, maybe one day I'll have a house, and I'll, I'll have a room, a big enough house where I can hang <laughs> laser discs from the ceiling. <laughs> we'll see. I, I'd love to see it. Take a picture if you do, Rob. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, what are you currently working on, Rob? Other than you said you had your little animated series on Netflix that's going to come out in March. You're yep. doing your 
uh, Imagination Connoisseurs, the film uh, festival. Film festival. Uh, you have a uh, whining uh, about movies. Whining about movies. What yeah. Else am I missing? Well, I I do have the uh, a feature film that I produced and I edited and I said I post supervised and also was the visual effects supervisor. It's a movie called Tango Shalom, and it's a feature film and it it stars a lot of New York actors like Renee Taylor, who is the nanny's mom. If you ever watch the show, the nanny. Um, and, and Lainey Kazan, who's in like my big fat Greek wedding. And it's, it's, it's a movie that my grandmother would love. <laughs> yeah. Like you, <laughs> you said know, yesterday. Yeah. yeah it, it's, it's good though. And so that's going to start playing in festivals. Well, we, for sure in February, but we might be playing it a couple in January and it'll be playing it mostly, as you might imagine, Jewish film festivals around the country. Um, and then, uh, uh, John Campia's movie that I was a producer on, John Campia made a documentary called Movie Trailers, A Love Story. And that hopefully we'll try and sell it. Or or if we don't sell it, John will probably just put it up online or something like that. But that's also been playing uh, festivals. So it, that was kind of fun. We shot that before the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, John and Jonathan Voiko, uh, fact checker Jonathan, they edited the film and finished it. And it's been doing well at, at the festivals. So, and then I've I've just started preliminary work. There's a movie I've wanted to make for a very long time that's based on a book that I am I'm right now I'm making what's called a story reel. I'm storyboarding out. Well, I have an artist I'm working with who's storyboarding out every single shot that I want in the movie. And then what I'm doing is I'm I'm going to have the first 30 minutes done, and I'm going to cut it all together, and I'm going to have actors play all the parts, record it all, and I'll do a 5.1 mix or 7.1 mix. And I want to I want to make it. I want to make that as my next film. But I'll have like the first 30 minutes so people can sit down and watch it and see, oh, this is what this this movie is. And I've had the I've had the storyboard artist draw into the storyboards the three main characters. I've I had them draw in the actors that I want to cast in the roles. So when you watch this story reel, it's like, oh, okay, I I can see this. This it was funny. I was thinking if all three of these actors are on cameo, I could like go pay them to do cameos and just have them say all the lines of dialogue that I need in the script and cut it into the story reel. But um, yeah, I don't. That would be expensive. Yeah, yeah it would be expensive. Uh, yeah, I, do you already have the rights to that book? I've Whatever been working with the author himself. Okay. So the cool. author, yeah, it, it, I've worked with him for a long time. We've we've never been able to get something off the ground. But I've I've literally, when I first came to LA like 30 years ago, he was one of the people I, I got in touch with. And I said, I really want to one day make this book. And it's pretty crazy. I mean, it's 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 definitely it it's it's a science fiction political satire fantasy. Uh yeah, all those things together. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I've been working on that. And then, you know, after the, the, the film festival is over, uh, we're running a contest, uh, and I'm going to publish a short story anthology. So I'm, 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 uh, uh, putting it out to my viewership. If you've ever wanted to write a short story between 5,000 and 10,000 words, you can. And the topic is, you know, I made up this term imagination connoisseurs. And so everybody who watches my channel, which is the Burnett work on YouTube, is an imagination connoisseur. And and what does that mean? People are always asking me, what does that mean? And I'm like, well, you tell me. Like to me, anybody who loves science fiction, fantasy, and horror, whether it's video games or comics or movies or TV, you are an imagination connoisseur because you are you are somebody that loves flights of fancy and uh, imaginative things and um, stuff that my channel's all about. So I want to publish an anthology called the imagination connoisseurs. So that's the only, that's the only thing that your story should somehow address. What is an imagination connoisseur? What does it mean to be an imagination connoisseur or write a story that would appeal to imagination connoisseurs. And what we're doing is the, the uh, deadline is, is February 14th. And we're going to pick one of the stories and starting March 1st, we're going to shoot it and we're going to make a short film. Awesome. So I guess the winning, call it the winning story. Uh, and then we're going to publish the book. We're going to publish the anthology. And I want the book and the movie. I mean, this is pretty ambitious, but I want the book and the movie to come out on May 15th for my birthday. So that that is the plan. 
That's that's awesome. I, this is the first I'm hearing about it, but it sounds very ambitious and very. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad that it's kind of like a pa passion project, just like your film that you've been working with the author for a very long time. Yeah. And I love that you're working with your community to make this happen. And yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I, the, the whole thing about the, my, uh, you know, my YouTube channel, the Burnett work, this idea that, you know, I call everybody imagination connoisseurs and the community is called the post geek singularity and the, the reason i came up with that is there's a guy named ray kurtzvile who wrote a book called the coming singularity that's all about ai and how when ai achieves self-awareness that is the singularity and when it achieves self-awareness that that exponentially who knows where ai will go and so i thought well uh, it's kind of a nonsensical term and i was thinking we live in kind of the post geek singularity and that all my geeky interests, whether it was Star Trek or Star Wars or video games or comic books, they were all kind of niche. Like when I was growing up, I was the only person I knew that was really into this stuff. Like I was a, I was a social kid, but I didn't really share how much I was into this stuff. Cause you know, I liked having girlfriends and I liked uh, my, my friends and I didn't want to bore them with, you know, let me tell you about warp drive and I'm uh, the warp drive on different, you know, starships and get really into it. Like I would at home, I'd sit there and read my star Trek blueprints for hours on end. I just didn't want anyone to know I was doing it. But now, now everybody's a geek. Everybody loves Marvel movies and everybody loves Harry Potter and everybody loves whether it's twilight or hunger games or horror or science fiction, video games, anime, whatever. I mean, when I was growing up, it was a it was a very small thing. Now we've exploded and and everything has gone mainstream. So that's why I like to say it's the post geek because there's no such thing as geeks anymore. All the interests that I used to be called a geek for, everybody loves them. You know, and so it's the post geek singularity which meant that it at one point it the whole it took over culture and everybody became a geek. And uh, so we live in the post geek singularity because we're all imagination connoisseurs. And um, so that's, that's the community. And so, yeah, I mean, I invite the more, the merrier. Um, we have the short story, the short story contest opens on December 1st when the film festival, like for all your re viewers out there, anybody that's watching this, you have until December 1st to make a movie. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, that we've gotten a lot of interesting different kinds of movies in, but there's one one movie that I I thought that it, it's called Confidence, and it, it's like four minutes long, and it's a guy basically talking to himself, various aspects of himself, like and he sh he's got split screen, so he's sh he shot multiple versions of himself, and it was just kind of clever. He's just the whole movie is him talking about this girl that he wants to date. And, and sees that she's she became single on Facebook. And I thought when I came up with the idea, and so it's kind of like inside out when different facets of your brain, like in uh, the Disney film, I just thought that, okay, here's something that you could have shot over a weekend. Pretty simple, funny premise, pretty good execution. I, I really liked it. And I'm like, I thought that's the kind of movie that I would get more of because it's not that hard to shoot. So that's what I'm hoping. Like, I know a lot of people have, have been working on films and the film festival is only running. I announced it. And then two months later, it's over. So it's not like people had six months to make their movies. I mean, I just made it up on the show one day. Cause these, these two guys from Germany made these, this film. And I said, we should have a film festival, you know, but that's what I mean. It's like, just make stuff up and do it. Like we could yeah. talk about doing, but we just did it. Yeah. Definitely. Next year I'll be submitting to, if, if you have a second one, I'll be yeah. definitely in there. Well, if, if we have a second one, we'll announce it so people can have a year to make yeah. their movies, you know, and, and we, we are giving out cash prizes and trophies and, and things like that. And um, the 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 biggest award for the film festival is the most imaginative award, obviously. <laughs> and and that comes above. Then there's best film, best overall film. Most imaginative is the, is like our Palm Door, if you know what the Cannes Film Festival is. Yeah. And then just below it is the best film of the festival. And it's pretty good. Like we've got sponsors. I'm always looking for sponsors because um, uh, uh, Beecher's homemade, uh, pardon me, Beecher's handmade cheese is sponsoring the uh, um, best performance award, which I thought was because, you know, people can be cheesy. Their performance. Is good. So I thought it'd be funny. because, <laughs> And they're, they donated 200 bucks. So the person who wins that award will get $200 and a trophy. Awesome. And, and the trophy is actually, 
based on the monolith from 2001. And the, the it was funny because Mike Bod, my business partner who had designed this trophy, I looked at it and I said, the, the, uh, the actual dimensions aren't correct, Mike. And he goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, the monolith from 2001 is one by four by nine. So for every one unit thick it is, it's four units wide and it's nine units tall. And the, the dimensions are wrong. And he looks at me and he goes, who's going to? Who's going to know that? And I said, me. I'll know that. So it has to be one by four by nine. Those are the dimensions of the monolith. And he's just shaking his head. And I go, but yeah, but wouldn't it be cool to get a trophy of the monolith that's one by four by nine? And you could tell people like, hey, this is that would just be like awesome. the monolith from 2001. Okay. So I, I never knew that, but thank you. One by four by nine. <laughs> one by four by nine. Yeah. <laughs> So it yeah. doesn't matter how big the monolith it is. If it's a giant monolith between, you know, in the orbit of, orbit of Jupiter, it's always going to be those dimensions, no matter how big it is. It's always got to be one by four by nine. Yeah. I'm looking forward to whoever wins that award and whoever wins all the awards. I'll be watching. Hopefully uh, we you get more uh, entries and more participants because <laughs> the more the merrier. Yeah, well, it, on Christmas Day, I'm going to do a show, a pre-recorded show, where all the semifinalists are going to be announced, okay. and then we're going to put the semifinalists up on 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 the between Christmas and New Year's, and we're get one of the awards is the Sally Field Lifetime Achievement Award. The actress Sally Field, she was the actress at the uh, Academy Awards when she won an Academy Award for Best Actress. She said, "You like me. You really like me." So for the person who gets the most likes on YouTube, wow. they win the Sally Field Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> the well, free. Oh, and our film festival, by the way, is also open to any uh, extraterrestrials. We will waive the $25 entry fee if you can prove that you are actually from outer space or another planet. It's the first film festival ever in the history of man that has opened itself up to extraterrestrial input. Now, I don't know how they, you know, are going to, even if they know the film festival exists, but we, we, we are calling it officially the first annual intergalactic Imagination Connoisseurs Film Festival. And we encourage any aliens that might have wanted to make movies, remember, maybe they're already among us. Maybe, you know, they're, 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 they're living in Area 51. I don't know. But if there are any aliens out there, we encourage them to enter a film in the festival. We will waive the $25 entry fee. I'm looking uh, forward to if you get any participants in that because I, me too, uh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. It's not over yet. When's the uh, deadline to submit? December first. So December you you still okay. got you got three weeks. The better part of three weeks. You got a bunch of weekends left. Come on now, everybody should start tomorrow's Friday. Pick up your uh, pick up your 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 iPhone and come up with a movie. And by the way, all the movies, all the current entries are available if you go to my youtube channel if you go to the burnett work the entries are all are all all there so you can look at them and there's some films that aren't there they're not in competition but they're still part of the festival awesome and you can see there, there's a really cool one uh that was that was came in from the uk that's quite fascinating uh that i dropped yesterday that you should check out. It's or called Remembrance, I think. Remembrance was yesterday's. The, oh, that, yesterday. The, okay. I, I meant I misspoke. It's the day before. It's okay. called New uh, New Lo Oh New. I always get it wrong. <laughs> I can't help you. <laughs> it's a strange. It's a strange. Yeah. Uh, strange word. But yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that sounds amazing. Uh, for anything RMB's doing, uh, his YouTube is the Burnett Work. Uh, is Twitter Burnett RM if you want to check it out 50 days until Christmas like Richard's saying uh, he's been very active um, he said he's a mod in RMB's uh, stuff so yeah as a matter uh, of fact thank you for coming around R the Richard we appreciate your help yeah if you want we have a, a very active community on Facebook the post geek okay. singularity communities on Facebook and the Richard is basically the man with the plan. He he oversees both the Post Geek Singularity Facebook page and the Whining About Movies Facebook page, and he always is throwing like Zoom parties and watch parties to 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 do things. and And it's a pretty great community. And there's people from all over the world that are part of it. And we you know we encourage everyone. My my basically my uh, I always say at the end of every episode, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear, and all you have to do is listen. 
And really, my only rule is that I, first of all, I believe that. And just when you come to the community, just remember that every person you meet, just treat them with respect because they have a story that you you want to hear. And it's all about it's all about. I mean, if 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 nothing else, the last four years of America has taught us that we really need to start talking to each other. You know, I mean, we're all Americans, and this divisiveness it does us no good. And I and I think that that what we've lost is the ability to have dialogue with one another. Uh, everybody's so full of vitriol and and animosity or or hatred or whatever. There's no call for that. You know, we're 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 stronger together than apart. So one of the things that I hope to do, at least with the channel, is you know, is is to bring a community together of like-minded people. We might not see eye to eye on everything, but we still love science fiction, fantasy, and horror. You know, if we can agree on that, then we have some kind of common ground that we can we can uh, we can uh, talk from. So that's kind of what the whole channel is all about. Awesome. I'm looking forward to all the entries you get, Rob, and just you continuing your kind of mission of just bringing these imagination connoisseurs to light and that's it. spreading the message. Yep. That, so, uh, that's, you know, I, I, I never wanted to think of myself as a messianic cult figure <laughs> like a David Koresh or that, or, or what's his face, the Nexium cult, you know, the Keith Ranieri, you know, if, 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 if all I want to do is I want to spread the gospel of how much I love flights of fancy, whether it's science fiction, fantasy, and horror, or movies in general. I mean, if you think about it, what other medium can gather, I mean, pre-COVID, of course, could gather a bunch of like-minded, or gather a bunch of people that are total strangers. You're willing to go into a giant room with 500 or 1,000 seats, sit next to total strangers in the dark, and all experience the same story that will hopefully move you or somehow uh, leave a lasting impression, maybe educate you, make you cry or whatever. That's the power of movies, man. You know, that's what, that's what, what movies can do. And people set aside all of their political differences, all of their religious differences, uh, any, any prejudices they have against race or sexuality. Everybody sits down into a theater, a theater seat, and they got their popcorn and their soft drink and, They'll, they'll forget all of those things and they will only concentrate on what is unfolding before them. And that is something I'd love the power of movies. And I, I think movies will, will never lose that potency. And it's, it's the best storytelling medium we've ever come up with. So it sounds weird when you explain it like that, but it's true. I, just I, I know crowding around in a dark room just experiencing the same thing. So despite their differences, you know, and, yeah. and, and yeah, who doesn't cry at the end of Shawshank Redemption when, when red finally comes down to say what now and finds Andy Dufresne working on his boat on the beach, you know, the <laughs> camera pans up. It doesn't matter where you're from. Everybody cries at that. Come on. So, yeah, it's a universal language. You, that's right. Sometimes you need subtitles, but just the visual like that, that's all you need. That's all so, you need. Yeah, so thank you, Rob. Next week, we have another amazing guest, guest Meredith Berg, uh, who will be on our show. Uh, we appreciate you coming on, and everyone watching, we'll see you next week. It was my honor. So, thank you very much. Yeah, we appreciate you, Rob. So thank you.